Councillor, we are live. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to the Estimates Committee. Mr. Deputy Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Martin. Councillor Antosky. Here. Councillor Utley. Here. Councillor Weaver. Present. Councillor Van Tilborg. Here. Mayor Davis. Here. Councillor Wall. Present. Councillor Vanderstelt. Present. Councillor Sluss. Present. Chair Carpenter. Present. And I see Councillor McCreary is here as well. Here. Roll call has been taken. Thank you. Members of the committee, I just a reminder that the following rules will procedure apply for the estimates committee. Uh, each speaking opportunity is for three minutes. We must have a mover and a seconder for all motions. There's no limit on the number of times, of course, you can speak to any one item. Uh, members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest or any items on the agenda this evening? I see no hands. I just would like to remind members of council a, a, a few uh, of my own processes I'd like to clarify. There are 155 items on the agenda tonight for public works. Uh, they are broken into groups. Uh, we won't be able to deal with 155 items and questions and responses like we've been doing in some of the other agenda items. So they will be in the blocks that are on your agenda. We'll deal with them in the blocks if the members agree. Uh, secondly, uh, we will we will we'll go through those items and then then at the end after we had the discussion, we can uh, deal with them them one at a time. Uh, you can ask questions on any one, any one of them and then I'll come back after you've asked questions on whatever ones you want in the block and then we'll come back one at a time for any amendments. And, does anybody have any concerns or questions with that? And if we are, are done at uh, the 155, for some reason, we get through the 155 tonight, the meeting that is scheduled for Monday will be canceled. Otherwise we will re re-adjourn again on Monday to finish off the capital budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joel Daniels, would you please provide an overview from step 9A? Uh, yes, three, Mr. Chair. Uh, we started the 2021 capital budget process with a proposed budget totaling $88,922,497. The amendments made to date have resulted in reductions totaling $697,975. So our revised starting point this evening is $88,224,522. Thank you. Um, now uh, we'll move to 5B. Do members have any questions below on the 21 capital project on 5B? This was an item that was deferred. Uh, you all had received an email of an update on the re request of information from staff. Okay, does anyone wish to speak to this item? Okay, uh, I see two. Uh, the hands up, not working. Okay, uh, I see Councilor Utley and Councilor Vanderstock. Councilor Utley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wasn't very fast in getting my uh, raised hand uh, button up. So uh, I, I want to thank staff, uh, Mr. Chair, for the um, report that they provided. Um, and uh, the question I have is if we go with electric cars, um, are there enough charging stations um, to accommodate those vehicles? If not, how long will they be? Be um, how long would it take to get uh, an installation? Is there a staff that can respond to that? Thank you, Andy. Good evening, Andy McMahon, Director of Building Services. Through the chair. Um, Currently, there is only one charging station installed within the city at the transit facility. Uh, there is a plan to install more charging stations at various locations throughout the city. Um, as discussed last week at the estimates committee meeting, there will be, um, or as a second submittal has been made for the approval of funds that could be applied to this. Um, we have received some quotes on installations uh, as recently as today. 
basically, it's, it's you know, it varies, but it's about $4,000, 4,500 would be about the cheapest to install one of these charging stations up to, I think about $8,000. So there, there's different options for doing this. Um, you know, this could be something that is added to the capital budget request to install, you know, four stations to service these vehicles. Um, the time frame to install them, they can be installed fairly quickly and fairly easily, the wall mounted stations. So it's, it's something that we feel could easily be done and installed within the time frames. Um, the time frame for procuring the vehicles is, is quite a bit longer than it would be to install the charging stations. Thank you, Andy. Um, and I, I, I get, well, I'll, I'll save my comments uh, uh, for a while and, and come back if I may, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And my apologies, Councilor Vanderstout. You were actually a person in the queue and I jumped the queue. So, Councilor Vanderstout, you have the floor. Not at all. I wasn't sure if everything was working properly anyway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Andy, I just want to be sure that uh, I understand what we're voting on. This is the purchase, uh, the 350000 is the uh, purchase of two different types of vehicles. Is that correct? That's what we ended up on, uh, roughly half and half electric, half and gas as a, uh, as a pilot study? Through the chair, the $350,000 is the original request that was submitted that is based upon seven electric vehicles if you know if the decision is to go with a mixed fleet of electric and gas power that number would be reduced okay but is is that not the amendment that i brought forward at the uh, last uh, meeting to do a comparative study on those uh, two different uh, uses so that we'd have better data going forward and changing our fleet overall I believe the amendment was a report on the option of using three and three. Okay, but voting on this tonight states that we um, would go all electric or half and half. And it, 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 it's all electric unless there's an amendment otherwise. Okay, please come back to me at the end of this for an amendment. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Councillor Antoski, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Questions and comments? Yes. Oh yes, questions and comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Andy, for the report. I appreciate that. Um, I, I am a proponent, obviously, of going for all of the vehicles electric. We made a commitment to our uh, climate action plan. Um, this would be a good start. And to have a pilot with three and three, well, we have two electric vehicles. So we've kind of had a pilot. We've got something to measure against. We know that our upfront costs are higher. We know as things go forward, um, the costs for electric fleet is going, to, they're go it's going to come down. It's going to, as we go into the future. Um, and again, we need to look at not just the dollar cost, there's the environmental cost. And um, I, I personally am hearing a lot from my residents in terms of um, the city being a leader and, and um, stepping forward in making sound decisions from an environmental standpoint. So I appreciate staff taking that seriously. Um, I don't believe that there's a need to do um, a pilot project. I think we've done that by having a couple of vehicles already. Um, so I'll leave that at that for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Antoski. Uh, Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't seem to have received that uh, report by email. I'm not sure who sent that out. Uh, if they could, if that could be resent. I'd appreciate it. But uh, um, we only have one charging station. But is there plans to put additional charging stations in the new city hall? Because my understanding was that was accommodated in the uh, accommodation task force meeting. Through the chair, Lisa Sordo, uh, Director of Facilities Management and Security, I can speak to that question. Um, the original scope of work for the prime consultant was to do a feasibility study of installing them into the new city hall. Um, it wasn't to include them at the time. We didn't have any any fleet, any um, city vehicles that were uh, electric 
electric charges. <laughs> we, didn't, uh, we didn't see the benefit of installing them at the time. Um, because there was no work being done in the parking garage either, um, there, is no, there was no real benefit. Um, there was no loss or, of not doing it either. And uh, we feel that they can be easily installed in the parking garage at any time. There's an electrical room right in the parking garage and it wouldn't take much to uh, run the conduits required and install them. And we actually do have quotes for that as well. Well, that's a very different story than what I heard at the Accommodations Task Force meeting. Uh, at the Accommodations Task Force meeting, I seem to remember being told that charging stations would be installed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, and this is not replacing existing vehicles. This is a new program to supply vehicles. Right now, the employees use their own vehicles and receive mileage. Is that correct? Through the chair, that is correct. And do we expect to see a savings by not paying out the mileage? There would be an increase in our operating costs for the cost of the vehicle over and above what our mileage costs currently are. Okay. And uh, have we done a comparison on energy cost between electric and, and gas powered vehicles for the electric vehicle that we have? Uh, good evening, Shane Pepper, fleet manager. Um, through the chair, yes, uh, my apologies, Councillor. The, the, that information was in the memo that uh, you did, I guess you didn't get a copy of. We have two electric vehicles in the fleet that have been in service for two years and we have done cost analysis on them uh, versus two gas pair of vehicles of the same year, similar model and same mileage uh, and usage. And and we, are, we are seeing a cost savings uh, on the fuel and maintenance, yes. A big cost savings, a small cost savings, 50%? Yeah. Like um, the, we are saving, uh, to put in the percentage, I uh, have the memo here, the numbers are in there, I, again, I apologize. Um, we are seeing considerable savings in the fuel and in the maintenance. However, we're two years in, we're, we're still under warranty period on, on both vehicles uh, with no major components, but um, yeah, well, yes, we're, like 50% or more savings on fuel. Okay, and the report we got about the electric vehicles for the for this program that, that's on the floor here, well, not on the floor yet, but uh, um, it seemed to indicate a, a very small savings when uh, you're saying it's uh, it's more like 50%. Did you see yeah, the numbers yeah. in the report? So through the chair, the, the report breaks down the numbers. The, the, the cost of the operating budget that appears to look heavily weighted on the operating side is the reserve to transfer for the replacement vehicle. Um, in, in, in the memo it shows, so just to, just to break it up for you to give you, a, you know, a, an example, on the electric car, the fuel and maintenance costs for the year are budgeted at $1,600. On the gas powered vehicle, they're budgeted at 5,000. So, the overhead cost, or sorry, the transfer to reserve for the electric vehicle, because the initial capital cost is more money, is $7,100. On the gas powered, it is $4,300. Okay. Okay, that's my question, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And uh, just for first time speakers, I have Council Weaver next. You have the floor, Council Weaver. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just making the comment that uh, I'm going to be supporting the original um, purchase of, I think it was seven. Uh, I think the city's probably had vehicles for about a hundred years. I think we have lots of data we can track and look through and, and really make a good determination on what the difference is between our existing fleet and these new fleet uh, vehicles when they come forward. Um, so I think we should go ahead and just move forward uh, with this purchase. Uh, electrical and and the limiting gas vehicles is, is gonna pass us by. Um, I think it's time for us to step up to the plate. Uh, and we did support a resolution stating that uh, we would be supporting climate change actions and this would be one of them. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Weaver. Uh, another first time speaker, Councillor Sless. You have the floor, Thank sir. you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I, I guess through you to Andy. A Andy, I, I think what I heard was that uh, we've applied for funding grants to put in charging stations. Did I understand that correctly? That is correct. That was not done through this department. Okay, but but as a city, we have applied for 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 grant funding to to install a number of charging stations. Correct. So, uh, maybe I'll take that, Councillor Celeste. It's really not Andy's question, and Lise could probably answer it. But yes, the short answer is yes. We we applied. We weren't successful this round, and we're we're told to re reapply, and that's happening. Uh, Lee Sordo, if I can, through Mr. Chair, uh, finish off my off my uh, answer. Lise, when, when is the next uh, time frame? Yeah, through the chair, um, I believe it's in, we'll be reapplying in uh, May June. Um, we will, probably won't find out until uh, later in the summertime, though, if, we'll, if we're successful on that second round. Okay, and what would be the timing if we go ahead with the purchase of uh, the seven electric, what would be the time frame of receiving those? The electric charging stations? Um, if we no, wait the electric vehicles. I'll have to defer that question to Shane Pepper. He might be able to answer that a little better than I could. Okay. Uh, Yes, through the chair. Um, if we were successful in getting the approval for the vehicles through the procurement process and delivery, we would be hopeful for probably a Q3 2021 delivery. Now I say that a bit loosely, COVID has you know extended delivery on stuff, but um, Q3, Q4 2021. So the timing of understanding the, the success or not success of the grant and get, we would know what I don't want to see is we, we purchase the cars and then we have no way of energizing them. So to put it in a logical order, then we would need to know that we have the charging stations before we purchase the cars or else we have no way of energizing the car, correct? Like there's a sequence of events that have to take place, but if they take place in not a logical manner, uh, we could end up with cars and no chargers or chargers and no cars. So the short answer is uh, yes, Councillor Councillor Celeste. That's the timing. We do have one charging station at the transit area. There's other. There's another seven in the city that are privately owned. One, uh, two by Laurier, one by the casino, uh, uh, one by Canadian Tire, one by uh, two Tim Hortons in the city have them. But uh, for our own purposes, we have one at the moment. You can also use a 120 volt to charge them. It takes much longer. But uh, the short answer is yes, uh, but we're replying for that and the timing may work out well between the two of them. But there is that risk uh, for the first few months. Okay. And, and if we're not successful, is there a contingency plan on how to fund uh, charging stations if we're not successful the second time around? If, I'm, if I could, I could answer that through the chair. Um, some of the funding, um, so the grant funding is just uh, supplemental funding. The city is, uh, was planning on um, covering the, the other half of the costs for the EV charging stations. So we could reduce the scope of that. Uh, we were going after 15 EV charging stations and we could reduce that scope and still proceed with uh, um, being able to purchase those charging stations and have them installed. It could take up to about a month uh, or a month and a half to have them installed after we get uh, the quotes. So if I understand your math, uh we have funding for half of the 15, correct? It's matching funds? That's correct. So we could fully fund seven? Based on our estimates, yes. Okay. Well, I, I guess having heard that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to me, uh, I, I did support the, uh, the climate change action and uh, I, I didn't sort of support it, that, 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 that I would only uh, kind of fall into line when it was convenient and not convenient. Uh, th this is probably inconvenient because it is gonna cost us more initially. But, but I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's what I committed that I would do. So I'll be supporting uh, buying the full seven uh, electric vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Slash. Uh, Councillor McCurry, first time speaker, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, through you to staff. So could you clarify for me, if we acquire seven cars, are we acquiring seven charging stations? Through the chair, based upon the information we have and the, the current amount of kilometers that we drive, our understanding is these vehicles would only need to be charged every two or three days. So, you know, for these 
seven vehicles that that we're requesting funding for, you know, we would only need three or four charging stations. So how many kilometers would that be per car per day? On average, our staff drive anywhere from 30 to 60 kilometers a day usually. Okay. Um, so they're all going out every day. So I know I go out some mornings and my gas tanks on empty, um, but I know that I can get to the gas station and fill up uh, anywhere in town with 30 K left. Um, what happens if a staff member runs out of electric and all the chargers are full? Uh, through the chair, um, I can maybe put a little uh, information on that. So of the two electric vehicles that we do have, we have the one charger and we do have to share that charging station. And some, sometimes some departments use the, you know, use up power more so than the other. Uh, however, we have found throughout this with an average of about 12 to 13,000 kilometers a year that that has not been an issue. Um, only in extreme weather conditions, uh, really, really hot or really, really cold, are they having to charge, you know, every day or every two days. In most cases, they are. You mean dead. like in, Shane, you mean like in Brantford? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I do. But in, in, and honestly, those periods are, are they're really only a couple of weeks a year. Um, like we're seeing it sometimes five, five days between needing okay. to charge. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me, who on your staff is currently uh, servicing batteries in the electrics? So of the, of the electric vehicles in, in, within the fleet, um, our staff is qualified to maintain the vehicles to the current level. Um, as far as the components on the vehicle, they're like for like, whether it's gas or diesel. Our staff does have training and is familiar with hybrid vehicles. We have hybrid vehicles in the fleet. We have some electric utility vehicles, lifts and uh, sweepers in the fleet. So staff- Now, when, when, you, when you say that, Shane, do you mean that they're certified on electric vehicle batteries? So the, the, the answer to that specific question is no, they are not at this point. Any, anything that we would get into on the battery components at this point is under warranty warranty period so far between five and eight years so we've had okay. no issues there they've gone back to the dealer should this grow or should this become more popular in our fleet we will be exploring the um oem or manufacturer specific training for the vehicles or okay. so uh, with respect to the electrics um it's not just work on the batteries that requires certification it's work on anything that's uh, remotely connected to the electric system correct High voltage, the high voltage system. Yeah. So, um, okay. So I guess when, I guess they know enough if they get into a problem to um, send it to the dealer, right? Correct. They have the their 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 training uh, provides them with the understanding of knowing low voltage versus high voltage training. Okay. They can identify that. And there's no change in our WSIB rates. No. Okay. Not yeah. unless they're not, no, not unless injuries go up, but no. Okay. Um, now, um, let's see. With with respect to so we got one one car per charger now. Is that what you said? Correct. Yeah, because they're two different locations. Two both cars are operating out of the one location because that's where the charger. Okay. Is. Yeah. Right. right. One, so, one car's being. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So when these when our folks aren't driving these cars, where are these cars going to live? I'll uh, defer that to um, Andy would know better where he's going to be operating the vehicles out of. Okay. Through the chair, the, the vehicles will be operating for the most part out of wherever the charging station locations are determined to be. Um, obviously if the vehicle is charging overnight, it's going to have to be there. If it's a situation that staff don't need to charge the vehicle overnight, then you know they would have to look at parking at any one of the municipal facilities that we have that that have ample room at night. You know the other option is you know staff could take a vehicle home if you know they want to work through the process of that. There there's um, you know a, a corporate policy on that. Um, there's not other than the uh, other than the, what it costs us for the car to sit in a parking lot. There's no additional cost to take it home, right? No additional cost to the city. No. Right. Okay. Now, with respect to the with respect to the purchase price of vehicles that you're projecting, 
for the next iteration of these guys, uh, the comparison, um, the uh, contribution to capital for the um, um, for the electric looks like it's going to be double what it would be for a gas pot. Is that right? Through the chair, yeah, yes. The contribution is seventy one hundred for the electrical and forty three hundred for the gas powered vehicle. And uh, which two uh, types of car did you base your? Sorry, which two make a model of cars did you base your comparison on? Uh, through the chair, the uh, the comparison of the, the vehicles we used was the actuals. So it is the two, of course, electric cars we have in our fleet. One is a Ford Focus. One is a Nissan Leaf. Yeah. And the two gas-powered vehicles we used that were the same age uh, and similar mileage. One is a Hyundai Elantra, and the other was, a, I believe it was a Chevy Equinox. Okay. And um, so the... the uh... The price you're looking at this time, the purchase chain for each of the electrics is fifty-seven thousand. For each of the electric is fifty, um, fifty fifty thousand each. And for the other, um, for the for the gas powered, for a gas powered of equivalent, yeah, it would be about thirty thousand. Okay, okay, uh, that's all my questions. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. First time speaker still, but Mayor Davis, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, through you. You know, I previously spoke to this um, at an earlier meeting, and, you know, we've made a, a commitment to uh, support a, a climate change model it, uh, that was done last year, well, I guess a year and a half ago. And then, of course, it's all, also in our council priorities that we set uh, late last year. And it's an important issue, not just because we've decided that it's a good thing to do, and that we support for that reason because it deals with our contribution towards climate change and starting to make some really serious efforts to address the issue of climate change, which we know is a very serious problem and requires a long-term solution. We've got a lot to do to mitigate the impact of city operations and climate change. This is a good beginning. And important, more important to me is it demonstrates, you know, leadership to the community that we take commitments we've made, you know, seriously and will follow through. And the other, I understand the concern about cost, but you know, there's some decisions we make where the, the deciding factor, the important factors go simply beyond cost, right? And money. Another example of that is a decision made late last year, at the um, Colburn Point property, where we've decided that the, the relevant factors, obviously money's important, but we've decided for the, that property and how it develops. It's not just about, maximizing the sale price. It's about what we put on there. And this is kind of a similar issue in my mind. You know, are we serious about climate change or are we not? If we're not serious about it and we don't follow through on a commitment that has a it has a price premium to it, it's, it's a, no doubt about that. But that demonstrates, I think, you know, our commitment to addressing the problem. And the other issue is that if you listen to the car manufacturers and commercial vehicle manufacturers, I think within four to five years, it would seem that electric vehicles will likely be the more popular option, if I can call it that. And that, you know, we have to get ready for that and to have the infrastructure in place, the charging station, the maintenance department that understands how to deal with these vehicles and how to operate them efficiently. And then, of course, the, the last thing I wanted to say is this whole issue of uh, previously staff been using their own vehicles and that's just not appropriate now for a city our size with a growing bylaw enforcement department having vehicles that are appropriately marked uh, it, it, it conveys to the community when someone attends a bylaw officer for for a call they've got a vehicle and the vehicle says basically who they are also allows for gps tracking more efficient management of of the employees and better tracking of the cost of the vehicles and how we're using them. So I think there's a lot of good reasons for doing this. I accept that there is a cost premium to it, but I think given all the relevant factors, it's well worth doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You still had 27 seconds left, good for you. Uh, now second time speakers, uh, Councilor Hartley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to, to staff, I uh, would hope that uh, we're not going to install charging stations at the current city hall. They'll be all at the uh, the new the new city hall, if this is approved. Uh, 
sorry, through the chair, can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Um, I said I, I would hope that we're not going to install any charging stations at the current City Hall uh, because we'll be moving out of there fairly soon. And I, I just wanted to confirm that they will all be installed at the new City Hall or that it could be another location where the cars are, uh, the vehicles are located. That's correct. We don't intend to install any at the old City Hall. They're all for the new City Hall that was applied for through the grant. And uh, thank you, Lise, and to uh, Andy, uh, what's the timing of uh, purchasing the vehicles? Uh, through the chair, once we have the approval of the capital costs, we would deal with, with Shane and Fleet to, to purchase those vehicles. And, and Shane had mentioned earlier that, um, you know, the timing would probably be Q3 to Q4 before we would receive the vehicles. Okay, that's, uh, so there's plenty of time to, uh, get those charging stations in place, assuming that uh, it gets approved. Definitely. Okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Councilor Utley. Uh, next on the list is Councilor Ntoski, second time speaker. Thank you, you Mr. Chair, Chair, through you to Shane. Shane, when you did the cost comparison for fuel and, and maintenance, were you doing it based on the cost of fuel, you know, if we go, if they went up to the yard to fill it up or based on what we're paying out per kilometer, 55 cents or 54 cents um, for people using their own vehicles. Through the chair, we use the cost uh, of uh, our fuel reports. So what it cost us to put fuel in that vehicle. We did not use what the mileage payouts is. Or I, I didn't have that, um, that data and we didn't ask for it it wasn't it wasn't considered at that time so yeah so I, I suspect that might have been what Councillor Martin was getting in at I think that the savings might even be uh, greater if we were to calculate that into the equation I know um, for instance and en Enbridge gas has stopped paying uh, mileage and in fact they found it cheaper to to rent vehicles for their, for their staff if they had to go to a meeting and things. So I, I think we'll find some savings there as well. Thanks for the clarification on that, Shane. Um, and, the, and the mayor spoke about some of the points I was going to bring up in, in terms of, um, you know, there's going to be, a, this is, this fits into a couple of the things in our priorities. One is a, is a visible action. I mean, those cars are going to be marked. They're going to be marked as, a, as, as electric vehicles. We, that is a visible um, accomplishment. That's a, vi a visible um, item that we've acted on. Um, and and we've, we've signed on to this in, in a few different ways. Our priorities, we signed on unanimously for the climate emergency and we approved the climate action plan uh, unanimously that was developed by our climate change officer. Or, um, so I think there are three good reasons for us to Put our money where our mouth is and and yes there is an upfront dollar cost but i think that uh there are uh, triple bottom lines to to look at and there are other gains on the other end and um as has been said here tonight this is important this is coming let's let's get on top of this let's move forward we're going to need those certified mechanics in the future we're going to need all of those things anyways so so let's get moving let's um Let's uh, use, use our staff who, who knows what to do with this and um, let's keep our word. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Antoski. Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you also, Mr. Chair, for multitasking and sending me that report on uh, while you're chairing the meeting. I appreciate that very much. Uh, a couple of things have changed since our first conversation about this. I find out that we indeed have two vehicles and there is cost comparison data. A question that I should not have asked uh, Mr. McMahon, who is the chief building inspector, wouldn't have access to that information. So I'm glad that Mr. Pepper is here tonight. And thank you for sending that information along. It looks as though we're into a very healthy discussion, but I, I wanna add a component that hasn't been mentioned yet. Uh, I'll be dating myself and talking to maybe half a council, but when I bought my first cassette player, cassettes and the cassette player was very expensive. When I bought my first uh, VHS player, it was a similar case. When I bought my CD player, it was a similar case. Um, if you buy a CD player now, you're, you're obsolete because you've got to buy Alexa. But when those first pricing data came out, people were spending an awful lot of money on what they wanted. 
we may be a little early into this market right now, but the price is going to come down. Uh, through comparison, through open market, through competition, the price is going to come down. So that's a component that will make over seven years our purchase make sense on one more front. What I was looking for with the amendment was the comparative data that would justify the purchase. It appears we already have that. Thank you again, Mr. Pepper. I'm going to withdraw my amendment. I'm going to support this 100%. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Van Councilor McCurry, you have the floor next. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm, I'm looking at um, at the numbers now, and I, I I think there's a better case made today for purchasing electric vehicles than was made before uh, Mr. Pepper was able to join us. Um, if we're putting on 60 kilometers a day, which I Shane, that was what you said, right? 60k a day. Um, through the chair, 60k is what Andy anticipated his department would put on. The vehicles, so, the vehicles we used in the comparison were averaging, I believe it was 12 or 13,000 a year. Yeah. 30, so, 35, 35 kilometers a day. 35. Yeah. So that's, you know, 60, 60 a day is 15 a year. Um, and 60 a day is uh, what, maybe an hour and a half of drive time at 50 kilometers an hour? Through the chair, yes, approximately that. So, uh, with respect to the drive time, what happens to the car for the other seven hours of the day? Through the chair, um, for the most part, our staff are, are leaving you know, one site, driving to the next site, and then the vehicle would be parked there for as long as they're at the site to do their inspection. And the intent with these municipal vehicles when we obtain them would be they would have a tablet installed in the vehicle so they would do their their notes and their data entry at that job site and mm -hmm. then drive to the next site okay um so this is going to be one vehicle per staff member correct all right um how much time do the guys spend in the office that's a good question uh, prior to the COVID pandemic, they would come in the office for approximately one hour in the morning, and mm -hmm. then usually about one hour after lunch. Uh, during these times, they would take calls for inspections, do their notes, review plans. Now with the work from home model that we have in place, they're, they're taking those calls in the morning at home and doing their notes at home and then going out and doing their inspections. Um, they don't have mobile devices to enter their data currently so they have to go home to do that so that's that's part of the reason for looking to get corporate vehicles so we can have those tablets installed that that would be removable as well that they could take on a site with them and take photos and enter their data as well on the site do you have any idea how many kilometers your guys charged us last year um i don't have the actual kilometers in front of me i can tell you that over the last few years our our budget has been, we spend about twenty-four dollars to $26,000 a year on mileage costs. So twenty-four dollars to $26,000 a year. And what's our operating cost going to be on, um, on these vehicles? On the electric vehicle was uh, $60,100. That's uh, for all the vehicles? For the seven vehicles, yes. And that includes the contribution to future capital? Correct. Okay, so we're more than doubling our expense, um, and that's to have a corporate logo on the side of the car. And um, um, remind me, what other benefits we get? You, you're right. It would be about a thirty-five thousand dollar increase to our current operating budget annually to go to the electric fleet vehicles. Um, you know, the benefits are, you know, we can gather data and, and prepare in the metrics and, and figure out routes so people can spend more time inspecting, less time driving. We will have a better knowledge of where our staff are for health and safety reasons. If there is any type of incident on site, currently we, we don't know where they are. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, we would have a more visible presence within the community. Yeah. You know, if an inspector goes to a site now, nobody really knows they're there. 
um, or to a person's house. They're not in uniform. They're in their own no, vehicle. I get it. Yep. Yep. Thank you. That's, that's time. I can put you back on the list, Councilor McCree, if you wish. Please. Uh, or you can put yourself back on the list. Councilor Martin, you now have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In doing the calculations for the cost on this, did you factor in that the carbon tax is going to be doubling in short order and, and going up from there? Through the chair, we, we did put the carbon tax pricing uh, calculator formula into um, the cost equation in the memo uh, to factor in uh, of the gas powered vehicles and what we know the carbon tax will be going forward over the next 10 years. So you have, you have included the, the increases then? Yes, I believe uh, Lise or Rochelle could speak in more detail on how they calculated the carbon tax. I see Rochelle's come on. Perhaps she could uh, get into a little further. Yeah, through the chair. Um, yes, the, the advertised price for the carbon tax increase is available. So we were able to calculate that um, increase year over year. Okay, thank you. And the concern about the charging stations is really not an issue. For the amount of miles these cars will be driven in a day, they can plug into a 110 outlet anywhere, charge overnight and have a full battery for the next day. We don't have to have charging stations to utilize these vehicles. All we need are 110 outlets that all the employees have in their own home. If they wanna take it home, then it can be worked out that uh, they're responsible for charging the vehicle. Uh, otherwise, they plug it into a 110 outlet in the basement of New City Hall. Uh, it's, it's not, the, the fast chargers are not a requirement for the amount of distance these vehicles are going to be used. So I think this is a, a good program. Oh, another question. Is the plan to go forward with having city vehicles for these employees one way or the other? Or if we don't buy the electric vehicles, will they, be, will they continue to use their own vehicles and charge mileage? Through the chair, if, if the electric vehicles are not an option, then the gas powered vehicles through fleet would be our, our second option. Okay, so the, the cost over the mileage charge is, is moot because either way we're going to be going to a fleet of our own vehicles. Correct. Okay, uh, this deal just gets better all the time. The more we talk about it, the more sense it makes. So I look forward to this passing, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, I have next Councillor McCurry, then Councillor Hartley. Councillor McCurry, you have the floor again. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, who's going to pay for this, Andy? Does that come out of your department's budget exclusively, which is all um, uh, non taxpayer funded? Through the chair, the capital cost for the purchase of the vehicle would come from the building department reserves which is not from the tax base. That's all funded through user rate fees. And your operating costs? The operating cost is a similar situation. It does not come from reserves, but it comes from the user rate. It's not funded through the tax base at all. Okay, so that'd be um, from guys that wanna build decks and um, front porches and um, small additions and developers. Yes, it comes through the building permit fees. Okay, so um, have you increased your schedule of fees accordingly? Uh, we have not. We have not increased our fees since uh, I believe 2014. Okay, and you've got. Um, pardon me if I'm if I'm remembering wrong, but did you have five million in reserves? It's estimated that we will have just over five million once we receive the final numbers from finance with our interest allocation. Okay. Um, and are you able to transfer that money back into operating? Uh, the way it works is we, we budget for the year and our expected revenue is set to equal our expenses for the year. And then if we have more revenue that gets transferred into our reserves, if we you know, run a deficit that year, then we transfer from the reserves to cover our actual operating cost. Okay, so if you don't increase your costs, uh, if you don't increase the charges to our clients in 2021, 2022, and you show a deficit by operating these vehicles, 
we can take that money out of reserves to pay the deficit. Is that what you just said? Yes, that's what would happen. Okay, so um, I would suggest that that's what we should be making happen. Uh, we've, um, I, don't, I wanna be careful how I say this. Uh, we've clearly been taking too much money from the development community based on what our operating expenses are in the department. Um, and it would only be reasonable to let them have a holiday and, and uh, let some of your deficit be paid for by the money they've already paid in. Um, Joel, are you on? Can you suggest a way to make that happen? I want you to uh, stick to the item on the agenda, which is the purchase of these cars and not necessarily the function and operation of the building department. I, I was really asking the question to help frame my vote, Mr. Chair, um, with a little latitude. Yeah, we won't be accepting resolutions on, on that, on, on the direction. Okay, thank you. Go you, I'll give you some latitude. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, Joel, could you, could you, uh, tell me how we would do that. Uh, would we sim we'd simply not increase his, his uh, fees and charges? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. The policy is already in place. That would see though any surplus transferred to the reserve or deficits uh, in the case that you're suggesting okay. um, be funded from the reserve. And there is no um, current uh, fee increase that's anticipated. Right. So if okay. there is operational deficits in 2021, uh, under finance policy too, those amounts will already be balanced to the reserves. Super, thank you very much. And thanks, thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Councilor Atley, you have the floor and your last one on the list. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to, to staff. Um, I uh, Somebody sent me a video uh, earlier this week and it was um, four or five uh, uh, battery operating vehicles uh, lined up. It didn't look like it was North America, but one, the uh, the batteries caught fire and they're pretty much impossible to to extinguish. I think once they've started and that went down all the uh, there were four or five cars totally destroyed. Uh, what safety measures will we have in place, or are the electrical standards uh, good enough that would suppress um, electrical fires in um, in vehicles? I don't know who can answer that, but through the chair, um, that's a good question. Um, we haven't experienced that in our vehicles yet, and I'm not aware of any, but I'm sure it's a circumstance that could happen. Um, there are, to my knowledge, I believe, uh, uh, what you would call an emergency shutoff. So a quick shutoff to shut the power off to a vehicle. So if it was attended by an operator or maintenance staff, they can shut the power off to the to or from the batteries to isolate that. Um, certainly we would have to work with our fire department for proper training and I'm, I don't want to speak on their behalf but I'm sure they do do training on electric vehicles. Um, you know they, they might be new to us but they're not new to them. So we, we would work with them and we would come up with, with um, perhaps policies and training for staff if necessary for those vehicles. Thank you Shane. I, I'm, um, I, I think it's something that's worth pursuing. If you could provide a brief report back to Council on that. Um, uh, the last thing we want, if we're going to install them at uh, the new city hall and uh, the fire starts, that batteries are almost impossible, I believe, to to suppress. I might be wrong on that, but uh, uh, I think the batteries in uh, in vehicles are are um, can be pretty lethal if they're they're set off. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Atley. Councillor Weaver, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanted to make a comment on um, one of the questions Councillor Utley just asked. I believe the video you're referring to is a video that happened about, I think it's within 10 years, there was a shipment of electric vehicles from overseas. It was left on the dock and there was a weather event in the States that flooded um, the dock and those batteries were then flooded and that's what actually caused them to uh, blow up. Um, the newer batteries are actually encased much better now. So um, that's not an issue um, as, as much as it was back in the infancy of uh, electric cars. Oh, I see Councilor McCurry's hand back up. Councilor McCurry, you have the floor. Uh, further to that immediate discussion, there was a, a Porsche which uh, caught fire and burned the house down. 
and it was found to have been an improper installation of the charging unit. It wasn't a battery related. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. I have one question of Andy. Uh, I'm trying to limit myself for questions as chair. Andy, does the building code require that uh, charging stations be putting with new uh, new construction of commercial construction? Uh, there, there was some changes to the code quite a few number of years ago that did require that. Um, and then the ministry made an amendment to the code where they actually removed that requirement that these stations be roughed in. Did you know how long ago it was removed? Uh, I don't exactly know when off the top of my head. I would say it was three or four years ago at least. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I have no more speakers on the list, so I'm going to move on to 9C. Um, and uh, Joel Daniels, uh, please provide an overview of steps 9A. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we'll now be moving to step nine of the capital budget worksheet, uh, which is the Public Works 2021 capital budget. Uh, this budget begins on page 239 of the capital plan document. And if you don't um, already have it open, uh, you can use the hyperlink at 9A of the worksheet. The 2021 cap, uh, Public Works capital budget totals 64,843,972 dollars. There's a total of 155 projects with the number of funding sources including gas tax of approximately 1. Point, or sorry 5.2 million uh, development charges of just over 6 million grants and third party contributions of almost 12 million use of our rate reserves in the amount of almost 23 million the use of tax supported reserves of approximately 16 million and debenture financing of 2 million Thank you. And now we're going to have a presentation from our general manager of public works, and we will deal with questions on his presentation during the items of capital. So through 9C items as we go through them, as we have been doing. So in uh, any hands, would you please come forward with your presentation, sir? Thank you. Good evening, Chair Carpenter, Mayor Davis. Uh, and members of council and those watching safely from home. Uh, my name is Indy Hans. I'm the general manager of Public Works Commission. And I'm here to uh, deliver the budget, uh, the 2021 capital, uh, Public Works Capital Budget. And before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment and thank uh, Public Works directors and managers in preparing the 2021 budget and all staff and especially frontline staff for their role in the uh, delivering of the 2020 capital budget during the pandemic, um, which had had uh, an impact on the delivery of that 2020 budget. I also want to thank uh, Joelle and the finance team for their support to each department uh, in preparing the budget you see before you this evening. Next slide. So Public Works is responsible for delivering services that impact residents on a daily basis. And in order to deliver these services, it's important to follow the project management principles uh, shown in this diagram. Um, there was a question by a delegate trying to understand the difference between studies and assessments. Um, and although both fall under the evaluate and identify and also the plan, uh, the main difference is that studies are a comprehensive investigation uh, that considers various alternatives to problems, whereas an assessment is looking at one particular piece of infrastructure and evaluating uh, its condition against similar assets and uh, prioritizing their repair. Um, so as we go through the budget tonight, you'll see how the design, build, and maintain, um, and operate and maintain could be lumped together or operating could be taken out, um, are also deliver, uh, driver, sorry, uh, when planning this year's budget. Next slide, please. So getting into more detail from the previous diagram, uh, for each component, the following guiding principles were drivers to prioritize the projects to deliver uh, or develop the budget. Uh, the team was tasked with presenting a fully funded capital project, or sorry, capital budget 
that advance the initiatives from the council priorities, KPMG service review, MSP, TMP, and other studies or master plans. Uh, to link infrastructure expansion to demand while ensuring maintenance of existing infrastructure is not ignored, but weighted against uh, growth related projects. Mitigate risk and, and uh, deliver on regulatory requirements. Um, and although the expansion lands have brought growth potential, the lands also brought existing uh, assets and the challenge to maintain those assets within the current resources. Um, and as development increases, as you know, the kilometers of roads, pipes, and sewers, and the need for maintenance also increases. Uh, the committee uh, will see projects tonight that are required to service uh, the city's former and new boundary uh, that will certainly have operating impacts. Uh, for example, uh, the formal boundary, uh, former boundary, we've seen parks bring, uh, being brought online, such as the Southwest Community Center and, and, and Park. Airedale Park, uh, the Empire Phase Six Park, and, and building into our new boundary for transit and how we're going to service that for uh, projects related to the MSP and the TMP. All of these bring challenges in terms of the uh, operating budget. And staff are compiling that information uh, while keeping in mind direction to minimize budget increases, uh, which we brought forward uh, during the operating budget. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go through 155 projects because we, we've, <laughs> we've only got a certain amount of time, um, but I do wanna highlight a few uh, projects that are in line with uh, the council priorities that will be moving forward this year. Um, so as you look at council priority one and all neighborhoods in the city are safe, vibrant, uh, attractive and inclusive. We're looking at uh, installing more anti-graffiti cabinet wraps. Uh, downtown revitalization is moving forward various state of good repair and condition assessment projects, uh, full corridor reconstructions, um, Garden Ave and Lorne Bridge continue, uh, as well as a corporate security program in downtown CCTV, which we've heard about CCTV through other, uh, our previous budget nights as well. Um, and also Woodman Community Center um, improvements. And you'll recall there, there was a memo to council in, re in relation to a pool versus splash pad and, and why a pool repair is required and, and needed for that area. Um, Southwest Community Center uh, uh, and, and Park. So here, here the request to, uh, we're bringing forward is to design phase two and start, start work uh, on the design part of that while coordinating between the city, the library and the Grand Area District School Board for phase three and moving that entire site forward as much as we can. As we move into to, uh, Council Priority Two, you'll see that the some of the um, priorities that are not directly related to public works and uh, have an impact in terms of creating capital projects. And so with the sale of Airedale, it created a capital project uh, for Airedale Park. And again, there was um, a delegate there uh, asking, uh, a couple of delegates asking uh, about the $4 million breakdown in the cost. Now, 2 million is being requested now and staff continue to pursue um, grants if they were to come up to phase uh, or to, to um, support the growth of the other phases because we are looking at phasing this park to get it uh, moving faster. But typically you're looking at a, uh, a high level breakdown in that $4 million of, you know, typically anywhere between 25% site prep and servicing, 65% amenities, hard services, soft services, and about 10% for, uh, for contingency and other related uh, matters. Now we are still looking and designing and we're trying to uh, move forward with that design and finalize the design. So these percentages are subject to change. So as we move into council priority three, um, creating a safe, efficient transportation system, um, you're gonna see a lot of work moving forward uh, with division zero road safety, uh, with Oak Park road extension. Um, there's an item here tonight for $2 million for Oak Park road budgeted uh, to help supplement the study uh, currently and, and the need for further investigation or studies that may come out of uh, further engagement that we're going to do because we are doing an enhanced engagement uh, with this project and, and possibly uh, assessing land requirements depending on the preferred alternative within the corridor that we have. And as we implement uh, and, and look at roundabouts or other uh, uh, items for Oak Park Road, that may uh, trigger some needs for land and so we're, we're 
presenting that in the budget today. Um, transit optimization uh, study. And again, I, I go back to the growth and how we're going to service and optimize our routes within the former boundary, as well as how we're going to be moving forward with the, the existing, or sorry, the expansion lines. And uh, as we go into, into priority fours, you know, this is a, um, an important one that we've been discussing in terms of the accommodation strategy. And we've heard a lot of discussion about that. And we're just moving forward with repairs and improvements to our facilities and, and staff accommodations. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, so the growth in uh, successfully accommodating in the uh, uh, expansion lands, um, you see some projects noted here, masterizing plan, which we completed this year, but we do require an amendment based on the uh, recent provincial updates in terms of our uh, forecast years to 2051. Um, but also you're going to see some projects included in this budget that are uh, ready and prepared for growth and detailed through the MSP uh, that included the MP Sanitary Pumping Station and Rehab and, and Brantford uh, Water Treatment Plant Water Intake and Canal Upgrade, which goes along with Council Priority 6, um, where uh, the required growth of um, the boundary expansion requires these projects as well, so the St. Andrew Pump Station uh, pressure, pressure district to three elevated tank, which was pre-approved in, in the Oak Park Road trunk sewer. And there's a lot of discussion so, um, uh, on green initiatives and, and uh, council priority seven uh, in terms of the city mitigating the environmental footprint and adopting a climate change action plan. And we did hear a lot about that uh, just now, um, but uh, we continue to move forward with the electric bus feasibility study and, and through some of the ISEP initiatives uh, in future intakes, um, look at energy conservation in terms of the initiative and implementation on our facilities, uh, landfill site gas collection, um, as well as street light upgrades and LED conversion, uh, just to name a few here. Um, and as we move into Council Priority 8, the, the full potential and community benefits uh, around the Grand, Grand River, we continue to invest in our um, flood control um, and improving uh, accessibility through moving forward with the construction in Waterworks Park uh, parking lot and making that more accessible for, for the users. And other uh, trail and bike uh, renovations are included in this uh, budget. And finally, again, uh, impacts uh, and, and working as partnership with other departments, noting museum and sustainability plans in, in uh, outcome nine, where looking to provide uh, some roof repairs uh, for Bell Homestead upgrade to keep that, uh, that asset of uh, and museum moving forward as well. Next slide, please. So within the, the budget, yeah, these are some notable initiatives that we continue to develop. You won't see in the budget, but we are continuing to move forward with this carried over through 21 and sorry, 2020 into 2021, um, but also uh, um, other initiatives that may require us to come to council, uh, including the development of the Green Bank program, something that uh, is an issue that we'd like to, uh, with council, move forward and keep on the forefront. Um, the Mohawk Lake and Canal cleanup and rehabilitation, we've uh, installed oil grid separators this year. We're continuing to move forward with some of the midterm and long term uh, requirements uh, to clean up that uh, area. Uh, to the height slope stabilization, the road management plan. Um, continue moving on with that. And again, some of the grant programs that we have um, uh, in relation to active transportation, uh, funding from the Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program. We've also have uh, pending grant applications uh, and we're hoping to be successful in these grant applications to offset some of our capital. Um, so we have the, um, uh, the asset management grants for our LIDAR survey of flood mitigation, which will continue to help um, our exactly that, our flood mitigation, um, our natural disaster uh, program uh, to, uh, we put in a uh, request for power line ditch improvements, Grand River flood control valves, culvert and condition assessments. And then the inclusive community grants we have in is to improve the uh, farmer's market washroom and have upgrades. Uh, and that is a, a capital item in our budget today covering a portion of the, the washroom upgrade. 
And we've also received the COVID-19 resilience infrastructure in the amount of just over $850,000 that we've submitted projects for. That includes the power road, power line, uh, road trail reconstruction, Wayne Gretzky trail uh, reconstruction, and, and the possible realignment of Dobney Creek trail and, and realignment are the ones we have submitted for that. Um, there's specific requirements for the projects and these fit that, uh, that requirement. Next slide, please. So some future challenges uh, that we are facing, uh, and I touched upon them in my intro, um, but strategy that uh, we, have to, we have to have a strategy and uh, in terms of funding infrastructure that's required to service development in the expansion lands, while ensuring funding remains available to maintain existing infrastructure for state of good repair. Um, there is that balance that's required. Uh, we have to set appropriate water and wastewater rate structure and, and look through the and complete a, a rate study and, and financial plan that's critical to support growth projects identified in the mass servicing plan and maintain existing assets and programs. Uh, keep up to date on new and evolving technologies, including our GPS um, in our fleets, and that can create efficiencies in our departments. Um, maintain and operate and repair and fund aging facilities, which I've mentioned while implementing strategies and projects. Uh, for the accommodation plan. And adequate staffing levels is required to support development of the boundary expansion lands and the climate change initiatives. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of what you have in your worksheets and how uh, the overall 2021 budget uh, breakdown is. As you can see, um, there is an extensive amount of um, uh, investments that we've made in previous years and so some of this funding is to carry those investments for as well as some new initiatives. Um, what you'll see here is again the, the theme of state of good repair over growth but a balance that's needed to to time our growth appropriately um, and so that's that's a bit of the balance here. Next slide please. I'm, not, I'm just going to go through these quickly because we did talk about um, the projects within each corridor and, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. Um, but just to, to give an overview in terms of uh, the growth projects and the 14 million, that, that makes up approximately 22% of the, the overall cap public works capital budget. And if we go into the next two slides, you'll see that the studies portion of our budget is approximately uh, 7% of our budget. Uh, next two slides, please. We could go to the next slide. So 4.4 make uh, in terms of studies um, and assessments and et cetera, make about 7% of our overall capital budget. And finally, in terms of our state of good repair, and that's where the, the majority of our, our budget is um, and, and to, to make sure that we're maintaining our existing systems. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one, please. Is 45 million, which is approximately 70, 70 to 71% of our budget. Um, next slide. So you can see through our budgeting system, we're, we're really, as public works, we work through uh, the plan design build. And you saw that uh, through that few, few projects that I've pulled out of our budget that we do have planning and we do have um, assessments which lead into design and with the appropriate design, doing those assessments and studies, and then ultimately building out and then maintaining that, that infrastructure. So staff will be here to answer questions and related to as we move into 9C. And I thank the committee uh, for, for allowing me to present tonight. Thank you, Wendy. And the, the members of the, of the committee, I uh, would like to try a little different process going forward. We've got, like I said, 155 items on the agenda today, but I'm not going to rush anyone. So we're, and I'm looking to try and have dinner break somewhere between six and 6.30, uh, but I'd like to get through 9C one to 14, uh, that way we're through a block of, of items before the dinner break, uh, if, if possible, that's my target. Um, now, if you look through 9C4, nine, nine, 9C5, nine they'll see a couple asterisks, and 9C7 and 9C14. Now, those items have already been approved at the December 15, 2020 um, meeting of council. So any amendments to those items would require a two thirds vote. So what I'm suggesting is that I'm gonna ask members of the, of the estimates committee, which items they'd like to separate from this list and then I can highlight them and go through them. I won't prevent you from adding another item that, if you think about it once we get further down as well. If, if that's agreeable, that might move us through these items for, at least for the dinner break. 
And I have Councilman McCurry first on the list. Councilman McCurry. Yes, Mr. Sir. Chair, are we are we going through them uh, one at a time as we have previously? Is that what you meant? No, I'd like us to you for you suggest which ones you wish to speak to, and I'll highlight them. And if they all hi get highlighted after I've gone through everybody, will that 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 that'll be the case? So we're we're just going to do down to number fourteen before dinner. Yes, that's that the goal. May be, uh, that may be optimistic, but uh, excellent, excellent. I would like to um, highlight five, six, and seven, please. Okay. Councillor Sless. Yes, I'd, I'd like to highlight uh, one, two, and 14. Thank you, Councillor Sless. Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you, uh, Chair Carpenter. Councillor Sless stole my thunder. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My uh, mind have been called already. Thank you. Is there any others that you'd like to, anyone like to separate? Well, oh, Councilor Martin. <clears throat> yeah, three, eight, and 10. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Okay, so we will start off with 9C1. Any speakers, please uh, raise your hand. Councilor Vanderstout, you have the floor, sir. Uh, sorry, Councilor Sless did separate it. Would you like him to speak first, sir? Thank you for uh, yielding the floor. Councilor Sless, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to get some clarification from staff, uh, if I could. I, I guess we'd probably be Indy. Um, we're into three and a half million, or, or I guess, what, three? little over $3 million between the previous and the allocation this year. And my understanding was that, that what's been approved there is the EA. Is that correct? The, the project itself hasn't been, been approved. What's been approved is to do an EA, EA on it and then take that information to make a decision. Is, is that correct? To the chair, that's, that's correct. We're currently in the EA stage. Yes, w which means there's no formal uh, approval we're simply doing exploratory work now through the EA process, correct? And then we'll deal with everything that that identifies further down the line as we move through the, the EA process. That was my understanding. I, I'm wondering, it, it says $2 million this year uh, for land purchases. Um, I, my question to you is on that, why are we purchasing land to do a project that we haven't approved? Right. So. In, in the detail sheet, it does speak to land purchase, but there's, there's also a supplementary studies that may come up through our engagement uh, with, with the public and agencies, et cetera. So there may be supplementary needs for funding there. Uh, in regards to the uh, need for property assessment, again, as the study carries forward, we don't know what alternative or alignment that we're looking at. We have a corridor. Um, and so what we'd like to do is that money set aside for surveys, et cetera. And, and if, the, if we are going outside the corridor, a different alignment and need to study that area particularly, then that all is lumped in with in terms of property assessment and, and, and what comes along with that. Um, for a little bit more detail, I've got Russ here to provide um, some more detail in, in that, but that's generally what it, what it does entail. And you're right in, in the sense of that we don't know what the exact alignment is. We're still going through the public engagement session. We have to engage the public for a second time. And council will see that towards the, hopefully towards the end of uh, 2021, what the preferred alignment of that roadway would be. So that would definitely come in front of council. So I guess you just raised more questions in my own mind then. So are you saying that we've approved a corridor and now we're looking at how we're going to go through that corridor? Yes, through the chair. So there's a corridor for Oak Park Road that we're studying. And so as part of the EA study, the corridor has been aligned, uh, uh, developed. We did have a feasibility study that also spoke to that corridor, but where the road actually shifts and the alternative space within that corridor are being studied. But also at the same time, there are other alternatives in terms of um, transit improvements and intersection improvements along Brent and, and other roads, Colburn, that we're also looking into. So it's not a, it, although the corridor is there that where we want to study and where most of our um, 
studies will be focused in terms of nat natural and um, archaeological and all of those studies are going to be focused through this certain corridor. Um, the alternatives actually do speak to other ones that are outside of that corridor as well. So just so that I'm totally clear in my mind, because I'm still a little bit muddied here, I think what you're saying is that you're, you're studying this area, but at the same time, uh, in parallel, you're also looking at other upgrades throughout the city that would maybe negate the need for that crossing? Is that what you're saying? Well, we're through the chair. We're in conjunction we're, with it. Yes, exactly. So it's in looking conjunction. at all possible alternatives and come moving forward with the preferred. So if it's justified for that roadway, um, then that's the preferred alternative because we've looked at all the others in conjunction with uh, the alignment that you uh, that we're all familiar with. Now, Russ can add to that if if there's anything I've missed to to maybe clear the waters a little bit. Well, I, I'd just like to ask a couple more questions, then, then maybe Russ could do that. My concern is, and, the, and, and help me understand that maybe I don't need to be concerned, but my concern is that we're going to go down this road financially so far that, that if you, for whatever reason, abort, you're in for so many dollars that you really can't turn around. That's my concern. What, what I would like to know is, is there gonna be a determination made that yes, this is definitely going to happen. It's going to be an approved process before we get into millions and millions and millions invested in potentially going down that road. That's my concern. I, I don't want to empty the bank and have not made a final decision that we're actually even going to do this. So the transfer through the show, the transportation master plan speaks to the need of this road. And, and through that, they initiated the environmental assessment that we have. So what Can I stop you right there a sec? Did the, ma the master plan not indicate that we need to find an alternative way to get people from where they are to where they need to be? And we identify this as one potential way of doing that. I'll, I'll get Russ to jump in there um, to provide that further detail. Yeah, through the, um, it's Russ Luke's Director of Engineering Services. Uh, yes, we did uh, transportation master plan identified a whole um, range of alternatives uh, to look at the long going transportation uh, issues are going to have go as a growth and this uh, a core our connection between uh, the southwest uh, Coleman Street into the northwest was one of those options and identified that that corridor as a, as a, a key component in that that whole suite of programs the environmental assessment as Indy pointed out is going through the process involving uh, public consultation to develop that scheme to get to that point. So you're going to have a point, uh, likely some point in the latter part of 2021, 20, um, where there'll be something coming back to council and say, hey, we've done the environmental assessment. This is a corridor that comes out from the study and uh, council get that opportunity then to decide where they want to continue on that that road. As you were asking, uh, Councillor Celeste, uh, you won't be keep putting money in. That's going to be the point and that's the money that's been approved so far. What we identified in the two million was to try and, as Indy pointed out, to make sure we get that enough information so that you can make uh, that decision going forward. Council can. Okay, and, and I don't want to beat this to death, but are, are we looking uh, at this corridor uh, in exclusion of any other potential? This is the only one being studied? Uh, through the chair, there's in the transportation mass plan identified a number, a suite of programs. Of, other things to be looked at, but this is the core of for that connection. It's been uh, the master plan identified. This is has benefits for that connection, has benefits to the overall uh, network. So that is why we're focusing on that that item to bring it forward to the environmental assessment, bring it back to council so they can make that decision going forward. If there's more to invest in that area, and if it's not, then they have to look at other options to try and do that. Okay, and, and just finally, if I could, Mr. Chair. Uh, the land that, that's, it, it doesn't identify the land, it just says some of this money would go for land purchases. Are these land purchases that would then we would have land holdings that if this project was aborted would be totally redundant to the city's need? Um, through the chair, there's, uh, uh, there would be, there could be some potential for land purchases for intersections. Some of those intersections, like for example, even the intersection at Colburn Street West, if the city now has a policy to examine uh, roundabouts, for example, versus other controls. So whether we look at that uh, broader area, so it could be a roundabout and whether some of those other components in purchase land, whether they could be built 
independent of the as a first stage even. But yes, there would be land holdings, and there is currently land holdings in that corridor as well. Yes, I, I believe at, at this point we, we we've actually purchased years ago, a uh, right way through there. Correct. Through the chair, we've purchased uh, a lot. I think the last purchase that I recall was about 2017 when there was another sliver purchase. But you're right. There is things bought, uh, purchased, owned by the city through there because we do have uh, other uh, serv servicing corridor going up that way as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sluss. I let you go longer than three minutes. I didn't have anybody else on the list. But I, Councillor Vanderstel, did you still want to speak to this item? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You have the floor, yeah, sir. I'm on the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Indy, you uh, between you and Russ, I think you indicated that uh, with ongoing uh, public consultation, ongoing studies, and ongoing EA, um, we're well into this year, the end of this year, perhaps the beginning of uh, of next year, um, before we'll we'll know anything. We're still studying this, correct? To the chair, yes, that's correct. We're we're aiming for um, the end of this year, bringing something forward to council. But again, uh, depending on uh, the the, in, the environmental assessment act allows for for part two orders, and and that could take you probably into next year. So we're not we're, right. we can't predict if that's the case. The goal is to come back to council by the end of this year, but that there is an opportunity there for it to to move into next year as well. Right, and and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, is is there anything uh, still in reserve accounts uh, that were previously dedicated to this study? Um, through the chair, um, I believe I don't, uh, as I recall, the, the information that's on the uh, going forward for twenty twenty one. Uh, draws upon the development charges uh, reserves. Okay, so I'm not aware of any other. I'm not aware of any other okay, sources so of funding. There, other than there that. are no um, previously um, unused funds for for this study. Through the chair, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, um, being, are there any other speakers in the queue, Mr. Chair? No, there are. Trying are to raise my hand. Mr. No, Chair, I'm trying to okay, raise my I hand. You're trying to do it. But I, I would like to, uh, Joel to uh, sort of give a more fulsome answer to Councillor Vanderstelt's question about uh, funding, because I believe we've been collecting development charges for this project for some time. So there must be some development charges in reserves. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, the project to date, both the previous uh, funding that was allocated for the EA, as well as what's being proposed, for the 2021 budget is fully funded from development charges. Uh, later phases of the construction uh, would be uh, development charge eligible. However, we will need to uh, work through the funding uh, of how that uh, the timing and when the funds might be available for that future construction. But yes, definitely what's been uh, funded to date and what's being requested currently is all through the transportation development charges. Thank you. I hope that helps, Council Manager. So you still have the floor. Well, yeah. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, after uh, after others have spoken, I uh, I'd like to come come back to me for an amendment, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Manager. So, Councilor Outley, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to staff. When is the EA study um, expected to come to Council? To the chair. Um, oh, sorry, Russ. No, go ahead. The chair. So we're we're aiming uh, in terms of our milestones is to come back to council towards the end of 2021. Okay. Um, I, I I kind of feel right now I'm reluctant to approve this without seeing that environmental assessment first, and I I have concerns like Council Sless um, about where this may be going, and I I, I just don't want us to commit to something. Um, that is counterproductive to uh, the whole project and the people that live along the uh, in the area of this uh, this corridor. Um, so, if uh, I wait till others speak, but I, I might move an amendment to uh, defer this item. Thank you, Councillor Mayor Davis. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. 
So if I, listening to what I've heard, I think part of the $2 million you're telling us would be money used to, in respect to the complete environmental assessment or making sure the environmental assessment is thoroughly uh, and fully done. If I get the, part of it's for that, I take it. And part of it is to purchase some land. What's the split between that? So I'll refer to, through the chair, you've got that right, Mayor Davis. For in, in, in regards to the split, I'll, I'll refer to Russ uh, Luke's for that. Um, through, through the chair, it's uh, well. It's very difficult to to do the the split. Uh, I think, um, as I mentioned, the, the some of these things are are unknown. Uh, purchasing uh, land in the in, for those improvements would be a part of it. We we've, we've lumped them both together. It's really difficult to try and s separate out the, the both ones. If I was forced to make a decision, I would say the majority of it is related to land, and uh, it, depending on the nature of the studies that we're going to have to do. But it's very difficult to make that judgment right now without having that uh, idea of what else may come up. We do know we're be asked to do a lot of engagement, a lot of virtual engagement, and that's going to consume a fair bit of that as well. Well, if I might just uh, make a comment, uh, Mr. Chair. So my understanding of the process was that um, we had the master transportation plan, we had a feasibility study, uh, we wanted further information regarding this route as to its feasibility, cost, impact on the environment, neighbors, et cetera. That's what an environmental assessment's all about and getting public input. So I guess I'm a little reluctant, as would I believe Councillor Sless and Councillor Utley, to be going out and buying land when we haven't made a final decision uh, where this will go, if it's here, exactly what the alignment would be recommended by the environmental assessment. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of different possibilities of environmental assessment. It could say, it, you know, you, sh you shouldn't do it. Or it could say, do it, but make these changes. And so I guess my concern, I'd like to see an amendment and then when somebody else doesn't bring it, I'll bring it, um, that uh, we try to pull out of this the cost of land purchases, but leave in whatever is required to make sure we do a very thorough, full, complete environmental assessment. If, it, if it, there's more money required for a second state public consultation, well, let's put it in there. Let's make sure we do this right. Because, you know, it's important to me that uh, this council makes this decision with as much information as possible from as many sources as possible, to make sure that we make a, a, good, a good decision before we start piling a lot more money into it. Um, and it's important we not, you know, prejudge it in any way. So, I guess I'm looking to staff, what's an appropriate amendment that would still give you the flexibility to finish off the EA and do it right. And then when we get the EA report, we'll then of course make the decision about uh, where we go from there. So uh, through the chair to Mayor Davis, um, right now looking at previous lands that we've looked into, I would say an appropriate value in, to remove that piece of it, but carry on and have enough for studies um, and even archeological and how far we have to go. I would say, um, Russ can jump in, but I would say 50% of that allocation is appropriate if, if that's the will of staff to, to move and defer the property part of that budget. All right, thanks, that, that's helpful. I think to clear up some of the confusion, thanks. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Uh, Councilor Martin, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Just a question about the, the design. Is there an intention to build two lanes initially uh, with the idea that the other two lanes could be built later and, and operated as a two lane road initially until we see how, how much it gets utilized or is it gonna start out the full four lanes right from the start? Uh, through, through the chair, uh, that would be something we'd look at uh, when we get into the design, there is a possibility of, uh, of looking at that where you'd actually grade the entire um, uh, width and then just only build two lanes. I think that was a kind of a similar approach was done on the Hardy Road, uh, sorry, Oak Park Road piece down from 403. It's actually been grayed out to for a four lane. I mean, you start off with two lanes. Um, the other part of it, of course, is the structure itself across the Grand River is likely to be one of the early pieces of work to do in order to um, go through the settling, et cetera. But that's definitely an, an option that we look at. It wouldn't necessarily make the cost half, as you could well imagine, most of the grading has to be done 
but it could defer some of the costs and see how that, that pans out. There could be some operational issues, but it's definitely going to be an option we'll be looking at going through the finishing up the EA and into the preliminary design. Yeah, because that's essentially what was done with the BSAR between Market and, uh, and Mount Pleasant. So, yeah, it's something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, Councillor McCray, your first time speaker. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you again. It's, it's maybe not completely on topic, but um, we've had circumstances previously where we've purchased um, uh, privately held lands to build roadways. And then we've uh, been faced with having to divest those properties years later when we decided not to do so. Um, I just wonder, do we still own any of the houses in Echo Place from BSAR? Uh, through the chair, um, I believe we do, but uh, I think that would have to be it's probably something answered on real estate. I know there was some lands purchased for various connections. I'm not 100% uh, certain if those are, but those are purchased. I think that's in a different corridor than this one. And, and it is off topic. Yeah, so thank you for that answer, Russ. I, was, I wasn't expecting one. Um, thanks for coming tonight, too. You're looking good. Thank you, Councillor McCurry. Uh, and I we're back to, uh, I see nobody else on the list. I see Councillor Ratley's hand, but Councillor Vanderstelt had, uh, Councillor Ratley, you wish to speak to this item or do you, because uh, Councillor Vanderstelt was first in requesting an amendment. Um, if Councillor Vanderstelt was uh, first to move an amendment, uh, I'll uh, yield uh, to him, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Vanderstelt, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Councillor Ratley. Thank you, Chair. Um, this this reminds me of a conversation we had earlier th this evening with regard to knowing your 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 data before you make a decision. And I was I was glad to see that when we found out what uh, Fleet came back to us with report on, we could better make a decision. I, I don't want to get locked into a situation where we don't have enough funding to complete the EA. I think we need to know um, based on what India said. Uh, that if, if we uh, reduce this budget by 50%, we're not going to compromise the findings of the public com uh, consultation. We're not going to compromise the further studies that need to be done into the end of the year. We're not going to compromise the EA, and that's why we did it. We wanted to find out what we can do, what we could do. From, from my perspective, I, I may be able to um, satisfy the, uh, the wishes of Councillor Utley as well by, by reducing this budget, by, by pushing it into the next year, uh, reducing it by, by 50%, uh, rather than a deferral. I, I, don't, I don't want to start down a pathway of uh, discovering what we can possibly do and, and then abandon it halfway through. It doesn't make sense. Um, from my perspective, uh, seeking a seconder, I think it's better uh, to err on the side of caution and finish the study. Uh, I see a, a seconder in Councillor Hartley, Mr. Chair, and uh, I would appreciate uh, council support for the completion of this study. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, I'm just wondering, uh, this money is all coming from development charges in a development charge reserve, so uh, it's not new money, but I mean, it might we, uh, I'm just saying, uh, wouldn't want to hamstrung the EA, let's say they're over by $50, and maybe the, a better resolution might be, and I'm just suggesting this, might be that staff uh, do the full EAA and come back to council before any property purchase or any final, before, uh, you know, would that, or do you want to stick with the one million? Um, what, <laughs> sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, to, to staff, uh, is that something that uh, works with your formulas? Mr. Chair, there may be a risk that we would be coming back to council to ask for funding to finish the study. Um, so that's why we're asking that a portion of the funds remain and the study carries on uh, without any delays. In that case, I feel comfortable with a 50% um, uh, uh, push forward into next year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Hey, any, any speakers to the resolution, Councillor Utley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, all, I, um, all I feel comfortable with right now is approving the EA uh, because that provides us information on which to base our decisions and the route, um, uh, the route that um, uh, it could take or routes that, that are being suggested. Uh, so I'm not sure if that conflicts with Councillor Van der Stolt's <laughs> amendment or not, um, but I, I'm okay. I, I, I would like to approve um, the uh, the uh, 
EA report. And I'd be willing, if, I'd be willing to do that on my own if that doesn't suit uh, Councilor Van der Stone. Thank you, Councilor Hartley. Uh, Councilor Slash, you have the floor, sir. I'm, I'm not clear what's on the floor, Mr. Chair. C could you read to me or could someone tell me what's on the floor? Or is the, anything what's on, on the floor, floor is, is, is cutting it by to $1 million and moving the $1 million, the other $1 million into 2022. Is that okay. that's correct, Councilor Vanderstelt? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead Councilor Sluss. No, the, I, I just needed clarity. I, I didn't know what was on the floor. If there's going to be a vote, I didn't know what I was voting on. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think it was probably driven a bit by my question. So, you know, I'll tell you what my intent is. I, I'll support it because I'm relying on staff telling us a, f a fair allocation for this year for the purposes of completing the study and anything that might be associated with that is about a million. Maybe, hopefully not that much, but they're telling us, I guess that's what it is. And so the intent is that uh, this budget approval is not used as um, sort of authorization to go out and purchase property uh, and they'd have to come back to us, I think, if they wanted to do that. But I, that's my understanding of what this, this um, uh, particular amendment means, and that's why I'll vote for it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I see no speakers. I'm going to call the question on the amendment. Uh, Chair Carpenter? Yes. Um, my program is telling me that my token has expired, so I believe I have to uh, reboot. Um, so I would like to vote in the affirmative, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter? Yes. Uh, I'm not getting uh, anything on my screen either, so I'd also like to vote in the affirmative. Okay, thank you. Through the chair, Chris Goche, deputy clerk here. I'm going to close the vote and and uh, recast it. I, I believe we're, we're having some e-scribe related issues. So I'm just gonna try to reboot it. It, it will take two seconds. Through the chair, I'm just waiting for Councilor McCreary's vote. There we go. Thank you. The amendment to item 9C1 carries unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councilors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Weaver, Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Toborg, and Mayor Davis. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, we are at five after six. With, is it the wish of the committee to, to take a half an hour break for lunch, for dinner, I should say? I'm saying yes. So we will, we will reconvene at uh, 6.35. Thank you.
Mr. Chair, have a good lunch, dinner. <laughs> it was quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, I forgot about a break and I was sneaking out and taking a spoonful of dinner at a time. So. Oh, well. Just to, advise while, oh, just, just to advise while we wait, we are still live on YouTube. That's assuming somebody's watching. I would assume they were. Thank you. We, we have quorum and it is 635. And the next item on the list, and I, I apologize for who put this on the list, but you'll remind me. <clears throat> We're speaking to the next item, 9C2. So I'll be, you can raise your hands when you wish to speak to the item and I'll recognize you. Thank you, Councillor Sless, you have the floor, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I separated this for a couple of reasons. First is, um, I keep hearing 4 million and yet I see 2 million allocated uh, for 2021. Is there 2 million being proposed for 2022? To the Chair, uh, to, to Councillor Sless, it's actually further down than 2022. I'm just trying to pull it up right now as we get back, um, I believe it's 23 or 24. And the reason for that is um, we're, we're looking at phasing of the park and it's just to, to hold a spot. Uh, obviously we would be coming back to council in terms of when that funding would be available or if it's pushed up um, after or before 23 or 24. Okay, are, are we putting in a domed football field in this park or like, I, I don't really understand uh, $4 million like I've got a, a park that was just redone down the street from me and, and I think it was $200,000 and, and, and it's beautiful. The kids love it. Uh, I'm not sure for $4 million what we buy. Um, $2 million to me is astounding. Uh, I, I'm not sure what we get. Do you know what we get for $2 million, Indy? Uh, through the chair. So for me, we got to remember that this is the 17 acre park um, and uh, a lot of it is grading, a lot of it is uh, the servicing around on the streets uh, and uh, bringing those services into the park. Um, but through, through the uh, surveys that we did have, although um, people are looking at Rolling Hills or Serene Park, but there's also aspects of the splash pad. That alone is, is typically in the range of three to 500,000. Um, but in my presentation, I spoke to you know, site grading earthworks typically in the range of 25%. And then you have the hard surfaces, trails and, and soft surfaces, trees and et cetera, benches, amenities, other things that take up about 65%. And then you, you'd have some contingency there uh, for the remainder. But um, throughout the uh, uh, possible designs, which will be going online, uh, asking the community which option they prefer, um, you're seeing uh, some water plays, some skating trails, possibly uh, dog park, pump truck, um, parking lots, obviously lighting is needed, um, uh, area for maintenance and equipment, um, possible um, multi-use sports courts, playground. So it's a, it's a lot of space, but that's also maintaining some of the, some of the existing use, which is the, the walkability of that park that's used right now. Okay, is the plan to also uh, leave some hill area so that the, the you know, uh, I keep hearing the tobogganing aspect of this, will, will that st still be available within the 17 acres? So uh, through the chair, my understanding is most of the work is being done in the flat area of, of the park. So that's closer to Rodden Street um, in that area is where most of the amenities would be going. So leaving anything on a slope uh, and not, really impacting that. 
So there will still be tobogganing in this park once it's completed. I'll just get Vicky to confirm the exact locations of the property line and where that, that occurs in terms of what we've staked out and surveyed. Okay. Yeah, um, appreciate that. But we're not looking to impact where or complete any work in terms of other than trails and whatnot uh, um, on those slopes. So I don't know if Vicky's available to answer to that. Oh, Indy, so. Indy, I can answer that. Yeah, it's Brian Hughes, uh, Director of Park Services. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Schlass, uh, the intention would be to uh, maintain uh, the hills and slopes uh, on the, uh, I guess it would be the, the western, uh, close to Rodden Street, and there would be a room for tobogganing. The, the intent would be to keep some, some of those slopes intact and not, not uh, change the contour of the land. And just one further question, if I could, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brian, g given what, what, what you're looking at, uh, will this be a functioning park uh, by the end of, of next summer? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's, that's difficult to determine. There's, there's a few steps we have to go through uh, prior to the uh, park, obviously, uh, being constructed. So it's going to depend on that timeline. I think the goal is to get construction underway this summer and hopefully complete it by the fall. So would it be functional for the winter? There's a possibility uh, if all goes well. Will it be functional for the summer? No, that, that would, I don't think that would be possible. Uh, keep in mind too, that this is a much larger park than normal parks that we construct. So when you, when you consider the cost of it in the range of 4 million, this isn't your typical neighborhood park. Uh, it's going to have amenities well beyond what would uh, you'd normally see in, in a neighborhood park. It's more of a community park, which obviously is, is going to cost a little more money. Sure. But, but by and large, people will be able to visit this place next, next, towards the end of next summer and, and see some substantial work have been done. Through you, Mr. Chair. I, I think that would be the goal, and that would be the intention, to try to expedite it as quickly as possible so that people can be using it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Schles. Councillor Martin, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had several de delegations uh, earlier in the capital budget, and, and some of them suggested that the, the four million price tag for this is not appropriate to put on the tax base. I'm wondering if this would be something that would be more appropriate to fund this out of proceeds of sale. So I'd probably lean on uh, Joelle or, or our CA to speak to that, um, Joelle. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, there is previous direction from Council on what to do with the proceeds of the sale um, of that property, uh, which is yeah. to uh, transfer those funds um, to the affordable housing reserve uh, to, for future affordable housing initiatives. Okay, but a, an amendment would be in order to take the $4 million from proceeds of sale and reduce the amount going to affordable housing, and then it'd be a council decision, essentially? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, I'd maybe have to defer to the clerk whether there, there would be a reconsideration. This would be a reconsideration, which would perhaps require two-thirds vote as opposed to yeah. um, just a simple um, amendment at this time. Okay, well, depending on uh, comments <laughs> others make, it might not... Uh, even worry about it. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Uh, Councilor McCurry. Mr. Chair, thank you. That was an interesting comment by my ward mate, and I think it merits discussion, but not here. Um, I, I, I think I heard somebody mention the word skating trail. Did I hear you say that, Indy? Good, Chair. That's correct. It's, it's uh, right now. That's that's an idea. Obviously, we're we're working through that. If that's actually being implemented or not, I think that that will. Um, I think what we'll end up with is a is a degree of nimbleness amongst the local youth surrounding this park that we've not seen before, as they try to dodge the toboggans while they're skating around the trail. Um, I, I realize you probably don't know the the detail of that, Indy, but. Um, uh, I wonder if anybody can speak to that tonight about the viability of a skating trail in proximity to toboggans. So through the chair, I, I think the look Brian can add, but I think the location, again, we'll have to, in terms of surfing <clears throat> and where it's possible to actually put that and look at the existing use and that, that particular use um, would allow for a certain separation between those two so we don't have that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we're still in the design phase. Sure, so we have okay. That, uh, 
capability of, of moving up. Yeah, now uh, some, of these, um, some of these features are significant and uh, I'm, I'm now becoming a little bit um, reminiscent of our discussion about Civic Square these many years ago. And some of us were around then, uh, formerly Civic Square, now Harmony Square. And uh, we proceeded apace with that development without having an accurate or honest appraisal of what the operating costs were going to be. And I can recall at the time, the former parks director uh, indicated that the operating costs would be about 25,000 a year. And it turned out to be $250,000 a year. Um, I think before we go down the road too much farther with respect to some of these um, more intensive and unique uses, we really do need to have a glimpse at what the operating costs are. Um, I, I, you know, the splash pad, we know the cost of that, but operating a skating trail, um, that's going to be very, very, very dear. And um, our weather is not conducive to natural ice. And I'm getting a sneaking suspicion that we may be thinking of refrigerating ice in that. And uh, I'm not so sure that we're, I'm not so sure that we're on all in agreement with doing something that intensive. So through the chair to the council, that's definitely something we should be looking into, and I agree. Um, again, there would be operating uh, expenses on this. Um, and again, with the with the skating trail, which I mentioned, not to not to stick to that one, but there's technologies out there that other cities have employed, and and that uh, sorry deployed that we're looking into. And the fact where it's uh, it's not really ice, it's uh, some sort of composite that uh, that folks can skate on as well. So there's other technologies to have that possibly year round. But again, that comes at a cost, as you mentioned. And uh, and are we going uh, uh, down that road? It's something that we have to definitely look into when we select the alternatives, uh, the, the, the actual alternative that we're gonna move forward with in design. And I think that's something that's important to bring back as possibly a memo to council to let them know um, what uh, the operating cost potentially could be for that, that design. That's super, thank you, Indy. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Councilor Antosky, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> it's, it's been stated already, this is more of a community park than a neighborhood um, park. This is, this is large and it's meant to accommodate uh, everyone in the city and therefore we want to have some amenities that don't exist anywhere else in the city um, and, and possibly look at opportunities for tourism and bringing other people into seeing this. So, it does come with a price tag. There have been uh, promises about this being the best park ever, and we know that operational costs come with that as well. So um, <clears throat> again, we're still in the design phase and there's gonna be a lot of op options coming forward. Um, there's an effort to really try and um, provide amenities that reach all age groups. So so whether that be you know senior workout equipment or, um, you know, tracks, walking tracks, whatever that may be. It's it's not just a, it, not just, but it's more than a playground for kids under five. And, and this is really to try and bring families together, bring communities together. And it is going to come with a price tag, but um, <clears throat> we've made some promises out there about this being a great park. And, and I hope that we will really uh, solidly look at uh, this as, as a solid asset to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tosky. I have no one else left on the list, so I'm going to move on to 9C3. Uh, and I, I, who separated that one? Please raise your hand. Uh, Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is about the Southwest Community Park, and I noticed in the write-up for it, it's talking about including uh, ball hockey which is currently available at Lions Park. So I'm not sure why we're putting ball hockey <coughs> facilities so close to where we already have ball hockey. And, uh, and the other part of it that I wanna question is the, the idea of artificial turf and a dome structure. Do we have a cost estimate on what that aspect of the park will cost? <laughs> so uh, through the chair, Council Martin, I'll, I'll bring in Brian Hughes in terms of the history around that. Um, again, moving forward with the design of phase two, that dome structure 
um, is something that we have to, to look into if that's a, a need or, or if we'd like to keep that out of the design. But again, we haven't uh, confirmed that. In terms of uh, your first question, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to Brian just for some context, some history behind that. Sure. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Martin, the actual hockey rink um, is was slated to be uh, an outdoor hockey rink, not necessarily ball hockey. So it was intended for actual ice hockey. It's going to be an ice hockey rink with, an, uh, once again, a refrigerated pad on site. So it was uh, an artificial outdoor rink with the intention to play hockey or, or pleasure skate. Not, not the, the ball hockey was not the intention. Uh, with regards to the second question, there was a proposal and there have been uh, thoughts about uh, one of the two sports fields in the uh, second phase potentially being artificial turf. Uh, and that being said, the rationale for it being artificial turf was to dome it. It's, it's, uh, it's a concept at this point in time. We we've, uh, have not investigated uh, cost to a, to a detailed level with regards to a dome structure, but there was also the uh, ability, there was interest from, uh, from some of the public sector groups and potentially some sort of cost share that we haven't pursued, but, but it's a very high level cost share idea right now with regards to uh, maybe some of the minor soccer groups and also the uh, potential to do some sort of a cost share with the county because I believe they're looking for some sort of indoor structure as well. So there's lots of opportunities to, to cost share on this project, but we haven't really followed up in any great detail at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Martin. Council McCurry, you have the floor, sir. Mr. Chair, thank you. Brian, uh, the outdoor rink, is it gonna have a concrete floor? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that would be the intent, concrete, concrete floor, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Council McCurry. Seeing no further speakers, I'm gonna move on to the next item that was separated, 9C5, and I believe that was Council McCurry, and this would be the technical studies. Uh, Mr. Chair, you're correct. Yes, thank you very much. This is the um, master servicing plan update and just bear with me while I find the right page here. Um, so master servicing study we've completed in 2014. Um, can anybody indicate whether or not some of the work that we um, that came out of that uh, study has been completed? Good okay. Um, through the chair, yes, there was a, uh, a master servicing plan done in 2014, and some of those items have been implemented. This addendum was to deal with the uh, uh, master servicing plan that was um, just approved by council uh, in 2020, and uh, the requirement for this uh, this particular um, item on the in the budget for 2021 is to look at uh, an addendum uh, for that work that was done. The work in 2020 was using a forecast of 2041 uh, as a forecast population employment. And uh, recently the province is, um, has asked to look at a uh, larger scale to 20, uh, 2050, 2051. And our official plan is based on that 2051. So what we're doing on this particular study is trying to update, uh, go back and look at what those changes would be. I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of um, uh, population, additional population of 2,000 and 1,000 employment and look at how that might change the findings from that 2020 uh, master servicing plan. So what initiatives have we undertaken as a result of that master servicing plan that we've actually built out? So I think some of the master servicing plan, uh, some of the work we've been working on is uh, uh, leaving some of the MP stuff, et cetera, expanding those areas and looking into those kind of growth potentials. Okay, and what's what's left um, from that plan that has yet to be implemented? So uh, uh, there's a number of, there's quite a list of items um, through the chair, I, I believe so. But I just wanna remind that this this particular item is is to do with uh, the technical study that we're doing to upgrade from 20. I just wanna lose that point. This study is about going from 2041 to 2051. What's the value of the work remaining that came out of our master service plan from 2014? The remaining capital works that are required as a result of that. Yeah, I don't have that number, but just through the chair again, this is about 2020 master service, not the 2014 master. The latest 20, master service plan is 2020. 
sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, um, shouldn't we eat our dinner before we have our dessert? Um, if there's work remaining to be done from the last plan, uh, let's finish that up before we're worrying about another 10 years. Okay. So through the, the chair, if I could just reiterate, uh, what we're doing is we're pr preparing a master servicing plan that's going to match our official plan. That's uh, essentially, we need to do that so we can develop our uh, de um, development charges we study that's going on in uh, 2021. So the purpose of this undertaking, we've, the council has agreed to and, and approved the, the 2020 master servicing plan up to 2041, but we wanna make sure that this is in, uh, in conjunction with what's being approved from the uh, official plan as well. So, so making sure those, these two, two tied together. When's the DC charge study? I believe the DC charge study is, un is being undertaken in 2021. We're hoping the master servicing plan addendum uh, inputs to that development charges work will be available within uh, in the first quarter of, of this year. And we bring, uh, after a 30 day review, we'll be bringing a report back to council on this master servicing plan addendum in the mid year of uh, 2021 and feeding into that DC study that's we'll be carrying on. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Councilor Schles. Sorry, no, I, that shouldn't have been up there. It was, I don't think it was taken down, Mr. Chair. Okay, no, thank you. Is there any other, uh, anyone else wish to speak to this item? Okay, moving on to 9C6, that's the technical study. Um, I believe that was Councilor McCurry as well, was it not? You are correct, Mr. Chair. Nothing gets by you, sir. You're doing oh, a fine, fine job tonight, <laughs> let me say. You have the floor. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> Sorry, $300,000 uh, coming from two different accounts to talk about transit optimization. Um, who's going to do this work? Uh, good evening. <clears throat> Through the chair, it's Mike Bradley, Director of Fleet and Transit. Uh, we, we would uh, uh, procure a consultant to do this work for us. What sort of a consultant, Mike? Uh, a, a transit consultant that, that does look at uh, route, route studies and route reviews. And, okay, so probably from Toronto? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the last ones were, so. Yeah, okay. So what, what do we need to know about our transit system that we don't know? <laughs> well, I think uh, it, we sort of followed the transportation uh, master plan. Uh, it's a high-level look at transit. This sort of is a, a more detailed study looking at optimizing our routes, uh, you know, looking at at current growth in the Southwest and also future boundary growth and what we need to uh, equip our transit fleet with, along with uh, looking at uh, future transit hubs, uh, looking at frequencies of our transit, uh, whether we need to go 15 minute service to hour service on certain routes. Um, so it takes into account all those uh, aspects of uh, running our system. Now the last, the, last, uh, the last transit study we did, I think they told us we should slow our buses down um, so we got people to their locations a lot, a lot more inefficiently to save a couple of dollars on gasoline or on diesel rather. Um, can you, can you say what the, the real value of this is to the community, to the taxpayer? We're, we're taking 244 out of, um, out of the capital fund envelope. That's a lot of, that's a lot of tax bills for a lot of families. Uh, and this isn't putting another bus on the road. This is, you know, is, is this providing us with better information than, your staff and our users can give us? Uh, through the chair, yeah, uh, yes, it does. Um, we have to uh, <laughs> um, look at look at all our all our routes and I think we can make it more efficient uh, in, in some of the areas that we're servicing now. Uh, and then we need to, you know, if we're gonna electrify the fleet in the future, we need to know what our needs are for that uh, and uh, what our future needs will be for boundary expansion, so. We have, a, we have an electric bus study that's um, on the agenda tonight is that not going to consider uh, how the application of these buses? Uh, that's that's correct. It'll it'll it's more for our, our uh, facility to know what we need to, uh, in our facility to uh, to electrify our buses and and whether the facility can handle that uh, those charging stations and, and what what are in, the, in in that building. Mm -hmm. And look at our routes as far as uh, how long those buses will run. We we assume that they're going to run for the full day without uh, charging them again. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Councilor Schles, you're, you're unmuted. And I next have Councilor Martin. Councilor Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to staff, when was the last time we did this kind of a study? Uh, we did, through the chair, we did the study last time we started in 2015. I believe the report went to council in uh, 2016. Okay, I, I thought it was more recent than that. It seems like we just finished doing this and uh, implemented some of the things from the last one uh, only just recently. Through the chair, we, we have been bringing recommendations back back to uh, estimates every year to implement some of those uh, uh, recommendations that were made through that study. They're, they haven't been all implemented yet, but uh, quite a few of them have. Okay, would you say 60%, 80% are done? I would say that probably 40% of those were. 40%? Yeah. And do you expect to get different uh, information out of this one or are they just gonna give us the, the, the remaining 60% of projects back again? I, I would hope that this is more detailed as far as uh, timing our routes. And, and uh, I think at some point we won't be able to bring all our buses downtown. So looking at uh, other, other uh, certain satellite uh, hubs out on the network. Is that part of the uh, requirements for the study to look at that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Uh, next on the list is uh, Mayor Davis. Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you to Mike. <clears throat> Taking off from what Councilor Martin was just talking about, frankly, I'd not be interested in spending $300,000 to you know, tune up and tweak our current road system. But so I want to know how much of this is going to be orientated, which is more interesting to me, I think more meaningful, uh, looking at the boundary lands because they're soon to begin to, to develop and whether or not we can really handle the transportation demands of the boundary lands, which will include a very large area of employment lands, you know, through a hub that's in the downtown. I know last year when we were looking at the tourism center, there was talk about, you know, do we retain that as a potential hub for the north end, given that, and, you know, with the development of hub, hub land, the boundary lands, there's going to be like another 20, 30,000 people in the north end. That's going to shift everything in terms of our uh, transportation needs. But I'm wondering, is it a bit premature to be doing this, given that, you know, having that kind of population out there is probably four, five, six years away. So... Um, through the chair, I, I think it's not too premature to do it. I think we need to sort of be ready for that and looking at those areas at a high level as far as what our equipment needs would be, where those hubs need to be located, um, whether it's at, at the malls or that type of area, or we need to build some other uh, platform somewhere else to service those areas. I think that's, that's what this will give us. Yeah, I certainly would support that because I think we learned from the Sheltered Lane Southwest, you're better to really do a lot of the planning before rather than after. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mayor Davis. And moving on to 9C7, um, trans Transportation Master Plan Review and Update. And uh, who is the counselor that brought that forward? That was me, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Curry, you have the floor. Um, well, you know, similarly to the last two um, studies that we're, um, we're scheduling, um, <clears throat> the transportation master plan, um, we last did it when, Russ? Um, through the chair, if I can, uh, again, this is very similar to the other um, master plan uh, review and update that we, we talked about. This the purpose of this activity that we're putting forward for 2021 is again to provide that addendum uh, to the transportation master plan that we had uh, just completed in 2020. So again, to take it to the 2051 to make sure it aligns with the OP and can feed information into our uh, development charges. It's important to note that that 2020 master plan and master servicing plan um, included the expansion areas, and those areas were not <laughs> included in the previous master plans that were done. So the answer to my question was 2020? That's correct. And as I, through the chair, as I, yeah, and this is, would be the addendum to bring it up to the, to match the OP and feed into the DC study. 
Okay. So how much, how much really could have changed in a year with respect to DCs for the transportation master plan? Well, um, through you, Chair, if I could, the, the DC's uh, study is a, is a different uh, component, but obviously the DC study was based on an unexpanded uh, city of Brantford. A new DC study will include those works that are required to bring those expansion areas into it. So this would be the first DC study that does that. It's the first transportation master plan that uh, examines those expansion areas. And um, the portion that we're asking for in 2021 is really just the portion to bring that up to re-examine doing a <clears throat> sensitivity analysis to see whether looking at the forecast of 2051 compared to the 2041, which was uh, brought in before, see what changes are required, what those things might be so that we can bring a DC study in uh, uh, that reflects that, that, uh, that reality. So the study we did last year, we didn't, we didn't do, we didn't uh, take into account um, the annex. No, that's uh, through the chair, not quite. We did take in that that area, but we did a forecast to the year twenty forty one, and that at the time when we chose that and what was done in conjunction with the official plan, that was what the province was uh, agreeable to. When we worked through to the very end of this, up I think it was uh, sometime mid last year. Uh, the province uh, said this place of the growth should be looking at 2051. So it was necessary for the official plan to change their forecasts to 2051. And we want to make sure now that our master plan is, is consistent with that. So this is just the add on to do that sensitivity analysis to look at a, uh, a longer horizon period. So um, if I promise not to tell the province, can we do without this? Through the chair, that, that would... Um, not be advisable. Obviously, there is a risk of looking at uh, uh, looking at our DC charge charge bylaw and not having it match the official plan and and uh, population employment. So it would, we would not be able to provide uh, uh, council with a realistic uh, development charges bylaw that you could apply to the the growth areas. It would you be have a, it would be detriment in that way. It wouldn't be a, a valid process. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair, through you. Following up on Councilor Carpenter, I'd like to focus on that. Uh, we know that updating our development charges is critical to make sure that growth pays for growth in the boundary lands. Absolutely essential we do it and do it in a timely manner. So I want to know how critical is, you mentioned, Russ, that it's going to be used as part of that? Or like, how critical is this being done? Which I think is more focused on the boundary lands <clears throat> to, to ensure the integrity and defensibility of our new system of development charge we want in place, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. It's, it's critical and that's why we are, uh, we continued on with the work on 2041 knowing that we would may have to make this adjustment uh, we are working very closely with um, planning and their consultants as well to make sure we get the, the correct forecast. We're expecting to have those in our hands uh, very soon so we can examine what that, those changes might be. And then, as I said, that feeds in to the development charges uh, bylaw so that we are um, allocating the correct development charges uh, to development based on the real infrastructure that is going forward and we've got a very solid base to stand on because he's um and i think that's a benefit to the to council and to the community that we we have a very solid base to move ahead so we can defend those development charges as uh, as we go down the road as development comes in over the next 20 years and development charges are sometimes attacked by those who have to pay them is that not correct uh through you, chair that is correct yeah so we want to make it as robust and as um, bulletproof as possible, if I can call it that. And so by not doing this, we would run the risk of exposing the ratepayer to having pay a larger share of that growth cost. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. All right. That's all I need to know. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And moving on to 9C8, um, West of Conklin Trunk Sewer Line number three, and uh, who was the councillor that wanted to separate that item? I believe it was Councillor Martin. Go ahead, Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, am I to understand by this that the, oops, I didn't want to find my notes here. No, it's not coming up. 
Okay. Do I understand this correctly that the, the difference in cost between 250 and 450 millimeter pipe is 1.7 million for this project? Uh, through the yes, that, 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 that's correct. I think the, uh, and then Gary Peavers, um, future Gary Peavers from our uh, development engineering can probably get down to the, the nitty gritty on some of this, but I think that's the, uh, the breakdown of the costs that are associated with the developer's cost and the, and the city's cost. Hey, Gary, you want to add to that? Yeah, through the chair, uh, Gary Peaver, manager of development engineering. Uh, that is correct. The, the difference there between the sizing uh, and depth uh, also has to be included. Uh, you know, installing essentially the first values, the smaller pipe at a shallower that's only needed for a smaller development. Uh, however, it was looked at in the master servicing plan of 2014 uh, that this pipe may need to be deeper as well to continue servicing the extent of the land. So it's not just the difference between the size of the pipe, it also includes the potential depth uh, that needs to be there to service the full extent uh, of the boundary of, of that drainage area. Okay, well, that makes a little more sense. Um, how long a, a pipe is this? Like, how long, a, a, how much linear feed of the pipe do we have? Uh, through the chair to you, uh, just one moment, just seeing if I can get an approximate. Uh, I, I, I don't have that in front of me, unfortunately. Uh, it would be tied to uh, one of the draft plan approvals that uh, just recently happened with the Linvest development. Uh, but the other part of the road network hasn't been established or hasn't been brought, brought forward to uh, city staff or council at this time. So the ultimate length is unknown. Okay, and how much deeper does it have to go to service the extra area? Uh, through the chair uh, to you, Councilor Martin, uh, that hasn't been fully determined. Uh, it is actually okay. currently being reviewed at this time by city staff. It needs to take into account uh, some preliminary grading that would occur in the, in the furthest development the, that this sewer reaches. Uh, so they're currently going through that exercise now uh, to set some preliminary grades to see what depth they would need to be to reach that, uh, that full extent. Okay, well, I certainly support putting the pipe deeper than rather than having a uh, pumping station. Thank you. Thank you, Count. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Councilor McCurry, you have the floor, sir. Mr. Chair, thank you. So the differential is because the developers only required to pay for the capacity that they will be using? Uh, through the chair, that, that is a, a crude way of putting it. It's essentially, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's that's legislated, I guess, because of our, our DCs? Yeah, through the chair, this is all legislated through our DC uh, bylaw and the DC Act, uh, as well as, you know, we don't see this all the time through the Southwest area. However, uh, this area we're, you know, particularly looking at because we have two different developers uh, that would benefit from this particular sewer. So will we recover the cost from future development, DC charges? Uh, yep, sorry, if I can, through the chair, um, this whole project is, uh, is funded from DC, portion from DCs and uh, a portion from the developer. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I, I saw the development charge of sanitary sewers. Uh, other funding sources is the developer then? Exactly. Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, super. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Councilor Vanderstout. Councilor, or sorry, Councilor McCray. Councilor Vanderstout, you're next. You have the floor. They get us confused all the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It's the hair. <laughs> Three to, uh, to Gary or Russ. Uh, the new uh, newly approved uh, block plan process that we have uh, talked about at length Will that also uh, be a, um, a mechanism by which different developers uh, in situations like this will figure out how to share the cost of upgrades like this or building uh, for future capacity in the systems that they're building? Uh, yes, through the chair to you, Councillor Vanderstilt, you're right. The, the block plan process that's being considered as part of the official plan uh, would provide uh, additional opportunities that cost sharing could happen without the city involvement, uh, depending on how big that piece of infrastructure is. Uh, it, it is another mechanism to have that cost shared about within that block. Uh, in the Northlands, there will still be infrastructure that services beyond each block. Uh, so we still would need the DC uh, uh, credits to be there, potentially enter into cost sharing agreement with the city 
uh, or DC credit uh, uh, agreements for that developer to build that piece of infrastructure uh, for the entirety of the Northlands. Right, but 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 just for the just for the 17 people that are watching right now, the new block plan, what we approved, won't come at a cost to the taxpayer. It is development paying for development, as Councilor Carpenter has often referred to. Correct. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Vanderstel. And nine C ten is the MP uh, sanitary pumping station. I believe that was also Councilor Martin. You have the floor, sir. Yeah, just a question on this one. When this issue first came up, one of the things that was discussed was the possibility of doing a tunnel and eliminating the need for a pumping station there and, and turning it to a gravity feed. Is that something that was looked at? Uh, through the chair, uh, Wendy Tufel, manager of design and construction. Oh. Um, uh, the, the tunnel aspect was um, looked at um, at a very high level, but the cost required to do something like that at this time couldn't be implemented quick enough or studied quick enough to uh, build the capacity up for what MP pumping station will be able to do. How, how soon do we need to increase the capacity of that? Well, I, I, through our design and construction manual, um, when, once the uh, station reaches 80% um, is the time we start to uh, uh, evaluate whether it needs to be increased. And I think we are at that point for empty pumping station. So we're currently, uh, we've currently procured a consultant to do the uh, preliminary investigations and detailed design to upgrade that station. But if it could be tunneled and, and do gravity feed, that would save us a lot of uh, upkeep on that pumping station in rebuilding it and in future maintenance. If it's something that's possible, it should be looked at now. Through the chair, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, but it is a very large um, capital investment up front. But looking at the life cycle cost, it might be the cheaper option in the long run. Through the chair, perhaps. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. I um, think probably Wendy would answer this, but so so Wendy, this pumping station, of course, will be servicing a significant portion of the boundary lands. Is that right? Uh. Uh, through the chair, um, I, I don't believe so. MP pumping station does take up um, a large area throughout the city. Yeah. And perhaps maybe Gary Peavers could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, through the chair to you. Uh, yes, this the MP will be uh, providing service to the expansion lands to the north. Right. And in, in the areas that are C8, C7, C6, those... All the stuff in the east end. Through the chair, that is correct. Good, yeah, good memory on the C uh, C nine and the C eights for sure. Yeah, and and those would potentially be some of the first areas to to be developed, given the vicinity and adjacent that they're the first lands that are adjacent to areas that are already built up. Uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, the particularly at the north uh, east corner, uh, there particularly could be an early stage. Uh, there's some other developments that are also closely tied to infrastructure that could go uh, fairly quickly uh, once the official plan has been uh, finalized. And because of problems we've had at MP Street, we essentially have in place now, not, it's not rationing, but you have to apply, right? Because we don't have unlimited capacity as it is right now. If you're developing a, <clears throat> a project in that area that's serviced by that pumping station, you have to make an application to get a permit to use a certain number of uh, percentage of the capacity, right? Uh, through the chair to you, Mayor, uh, that is correct. It's the uh, wastewater allocation policy right. <clears throat> uh, that has been established. So any future greenfield sites would have to apply for allocation uh, to the MP pumping station. Uh, and that policy does set forth uh, a procedure that could be followed if uh, allocation does run out. Uh, I, I think it's important to note that uh, you know, this is getting the process started early so that we hopefully don't come to that uh, to that situation. Yeah, so that gets to one of my last set of questions, which is 
So we know we've had capacity issues at pumping stations. It's been, a, it's been a constraint on growth, getting us into this allocation system. Uh, what is the percentage increase in capacity that we'll realize as a result of this investment? Is it a simple, can you give us a simple percentage? Uh, or are we gonna need more investment in this pumping station as the boundary lands expand? Uh, through the chair to you, I might refer to Wendy on the, the full project uh, entitled of what uh, is for MP pumping station. Um, ultimately, uh, I believe there would be a multi-stage approach when you consider all of the expansion lands with MP. Um, you know, I, I, I think no matter what you do, uh, when looking at a pumping station, if you build it completely for your expansion right to uh, the annex lands, you would have a, a quite a bit of uh, cost of operating costs for a pumping station that's not running at uh, yeah. operational efficiencies. Right. And my last question, uh, Mr. Chair. So this is generally paid through development charge reserve and uh, wastewater and related charges. So it doesn't fall under the rate there, correct? Uh, it's Russell, through the chair, that's correct. Those are the funding sources that are used for this okay. project. So we're redoing the development charges. Some of this will fund, be there to service the boundary lands. Will, the, will it be likely that the development charges that we'll be charging in this area will be used to pay part of this or a greater proportion of this? I guess it doesn't matter if it comes out of one reserve or the other. But. So I guess my question is really, how, does the new, how is the new development charge uh, bylaw going to likely impact in a project like this, if at all? Yeah. Yeah, th sorry. Through the chair, it's, it's likely to be more on the DC side. Yeah. I assume that those DCs would be used that we collect eventually or be used for further upgrades of this station. Is that the intent? Uh, through the chair, that's that's correct. Those uh, that's why we complete a master servicing plan. Look at those long-term growth. Uh, without this pumping station, it's key to that whole growth component. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Councillor Vanderstelt, you're the last one on my list. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well done tonight. Uh, further to Councillor Martin's line, uh, Martin's Martin's line of questioning. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wendy, I'm wondering if you could bring uh, a little bit more clarity to the question. Um, how long would a study take in order to find out whether or not there's an advantage to gravity fed as opposed to a pumping station? Uh, is there enough time? I mean, I, I would rather forego the amount of operational dollars that it would take if there was enough time to do so. Um, is there, can you put any numbers to that or timelines to that? Uh, through the chair, um, it's pretty high level, but I would uh, anticipate when you're looking at something like that, you're looking at buying property, uh, most likely trying to tunnel through. Uh, something like that would take a number of years to actually even build, let alone even study the feasibility of it. Um, to do the feasibility, um, currently right now we are, we have procured the consultant to start work on the MP pumping station because of the cost that were kind of realized for this, this thought of, of building a tunnel from instead of MP pumping station. So I don't really have a very clear answer on that, but it would, I would, I would suggest a, a feasibility study for that would take a year or more. And, and do we have any intention of doing that? I mean, I know we're gonna be, be putting upgrades into the system as we grow, as we grow North Power Line, but yeah. uh, is there any intention to study it? Um, through the chair, not at that time, there isn't, but certainly that's something we could look at in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Having here those concerns, could uh, we see uh, some kind of a, a basic, a, a small report on what the um, ballpark cost might be in, uh, on, on doing the study and the ballpark costs of the tunnel? So for staff, to for council, chair. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And seeing no, moving on to 9C14, the Pressure District Two and Three Elevated Tank, and I think that was Councilor Martin as well. It was what Councilor Martin. You have the floor. No, I don't think I was uh, the one who requested that. I don't have any notes on that one. 
Okay. I think it was me, uh, Councillor uh, Carpenter. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Slash, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I read the background on this. Is, is the intent to build another uh, water tower? Good evening, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Selvi here, uh, Director of Environmental Services. Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Sless, the intention is to build an elevated water storage tank, um, likely north of Powerline Road, to service the boundary expansion lands. Okay, th that was actually my next question. Do we have an exact location for this? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, we don't. That will come uh, through the uh, EA uh, environmental assessment study. They will look at multiple locations and the pros and cons and select uh, or recommend a study. And it also involves public consultation. So we don't have the site at this time. I, I would suggest that, that, uh, that we look at places that aren't developed yet, uh, much similar like we did out in the uh, Southwest. We don't want to be building it in the middle of a bunch of, of newly constructed houses and then decide to put a tower there. So I would suggest that. And I, I think it also indicates that the, uh, the tower that we're all familiar with on the 403 uh, will be decommissioned. W what exactly does that mean? W like it will no longer be used, will it be disassembled and re removed? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um... Uh, what exactly the fate of the tank, what exactly we're going to do, we haven't figured out yet, but the King George tank is at the end of its life. So when we build this new tank north of Powerline Road, we, we can eliminate this tank because the new tank will service all of this area. Um, so uh, we will consult with the council at the time, what is the direction for the um, King George tank, what we need to do. And just, is there a time frame for this all to take place? Um, we estimate, through you, Mr. Chair, we estimate roughly five years uh, for the power line, uh, sorry, the new elevated tank uh, to be constructed. So we have to commission the new tank first and make everything work before we start abandoning. So that's the time we'll come back to council about uh, what to do with the King George tank. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Schles. Uh, Councillor Outley, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to, uh, to Selby. Um, Selby, um, at either end of the city in the new growth lands are industrial areas. And, and I would hope that um, one of those two would be um, the, the most appropriate site for two reasons. One, I think in the west end of Powerline Road, the uh, land is elevated somewhat uh, there. Um, and uh, um, and I, I think it would be less intrusive to uh, residential uh, areas as well. On the east side of the city, I think the industrial land is is maybe uh, quite a bit lower than uh, uh, than the west end. But anyway, the study will will uh, bring that out. So my money's on the industrial land at the west end. Thank you. Through you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, if I could add to that, um, in the master servicing plan, it recommended somewhere north um, uh, Powerline Road, but along between King George and Wayne Gretzky. But again, uh, we'll determine the site. Um, uh, the the, the, it, it, uh, the, in the master servicing plan, it did identify the eastern industrial lands are too low. So that's not uh, exactly in the picture at this time. Um, the northern lands is definitely, sorry, the western lands, uh, industrial lands are definitely in the picture. So we have to figure out um, if a tank needs to be in the west uh, end of the uh, uh, western lands because there, the study also recommended another elevated tank far west of those uh, boundary expansion lands. So all that will be considered part of our study. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have Councilor McCurry unless. Councilor McCurry, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Sylvie. We've heard uh, uh, numerous times this um, review of capital that something's at the end of its life. Um, can you specifically say what there is about the King George Road water tank that cannot be remedied? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, to Councillor McCurry, is that the, the tank 
Um, roughly uh, the age of the tank is uh, 60 years old is what we get most out of the tank. We already see more repairs. So the, 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 it's a metal tank. So we're seeing more rusting and more repairs. So beyond uh, 60 years, um, it, it becomes the maintenance cost and repair cost is excessive. Um, and, and so that's the reasons why it will be eliminated. Um, can you provide us with an indication of um, how those costs have increased, say, over the last 20 years? I know we had a major retrofit of that some time ago, which included a new paint from top to bottom. Um, so I think it would be of interest to us to see how that's quantified, Selvi. Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we can provide that to you, uh, Councillor. Um, now, there is the other issue with the existing tank is that it limits the pressure in the area around uh, the current King George Road area. The, the pressure around that area is uh, like kind of barely um, provides enough if they have irrigation system and everything. Um, so we consider all that into consideration, but if you're looking for how much maintenance costs spent on it, we can give that information to you. Uh, you're muted, Councilman McCurry. Turn that mute button. Um, is there quantifiable um, support for the decline in pressure in that area, Sylvie? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, we do get um, uh, residents asking for more pressure, and that area has lower pressure uh, compared to the general area of the city, other than high elevated lands, um, like uh, the Strawberry Hill and West uh, Colborne Street West. The rest of the area usually have above uh, 60, 70 PSI, but this area has around 50 or so PSI, so that's been something the residents and uh, the area has been uh, uh, we've received, uh, you know, periodically we receive calls. Thank you. Thank you, Council McCurry. Council Martin, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the reduction in pressure, is that because you're not filling the tank or is that because of uh, corrosion uh, re restricting flow? Through you, Mr. Chair, the tank is not tall enough. So we need to increase the height of the tank to give more pressure. Um, so that's the restricting factor there. So this has been a problem all along? Um, I don't remember that, that being a problem in this area. Through you, Mr. Chair, as the growth increases, the pressure seems to uh, decline, but it's it's been all along, uh, especially more so um, uh, that we are hearing from the residents. Yeah. News to me. Thank you. Thank you, Selby. And now we're moving on to items 9C15 to 9C26. I'll give uh, members of the committee a chance to look at the ones they like to separate, uh, give you a minute or so, and then uh, you can start raising your hands and I'll ask you for your separations. Council McCurry, separations. Uh, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 26. 26. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Davis, separations, please. Yeah, sorry, how many? Council McCurry said it so fast, I wasn't able to. Uh, 15, 17, 18, 19, 21, and 26, I believe. <clears throat> and, and 20, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay, uh, 22 and 25. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, nine, we'll move to 9C15. Uh, and Council McCurry, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chair, just give me a second. This is the raw water intake uh, canal upgrade. Yeah, um, it appears. Yeah, so this appears that we're enlarging the size of the canal that brings us our drinking water, uh, Sylvie. Where will the water come from while we're undertaking this work? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
the the it is it will be from the Grand River. So what they do is they'll do like a coffer dam or separate the river, sorry, the canal into two halves. So those the water will come from the river through half of the canal, and the work will be done on the other half. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no other. And Sylvia, this work is going to be done in twenty twenty two. The total where it's got a budget of four and a half million. Um. Through you, Mr. Chair. So that is our plan. We will do the study in 21, uh, sorry, the design in 21 and the construction in 22. Okay, thank you. And moving on to 9C17, that's uh, Council McCurry, you have the floor. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. This is the um, accessibility improvement initiatives uh, to comply with the AODA. Um, just bear with me one second while I get to the right page. Um, so we're we're still maintaining the age old contribution that we've made annually of $100,000. Um, are, we, are we required to be completely AODA compliant by 2025? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councilor McCurry. Yes, that's correct. We need to be compliant by 2025. Okay, are we gonna be there? Uh, we're almost there. Uh, there's several facilities that still require some upgrades. Okay, uh, so beyond 2025, we still have money in the budget annually. Um, if we are going to achieve it in 2025, uh, why do we need money beyond that date? Um, hopefully we should be able to drop it by then. Should we drop it? Should we drop it tonight? We can. Yeah, okay. Um, you're sure though, Lise, because we, we wanna make sure that we, we hit that benchmark and if we need more money, we've gotta be sure we've got it, okay? Um, so you're you're 100 satisfied. We'll be there. Providing we don't purchase any facilities that require upgrades, um, I feel that we can. Um, we can always revisit this um, in the coming years as well. This is an outlook for the next uh, 10 years, and uh, right. I don't think we're approving the 10-year plan at this time. Just just the 2021. Yeah, this this includes all the things that you wouldn't think of, right? Like. Um, like um, uh, the way we interact with the public online. Uh, so it's not just the physical changes, it's all the AODA compliance issues, that's all covered? That's correct, it includes communications yeah. and uh, information technologies, that kind of thing as Okay, well. excellent, thank you very much. No thank you, Councilor McCurry. Moving on to uh, 9C18, I believe that was yours as well, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, let's see now. Um, this is to design and implement a corporate security program in a downtown CCTV system. Cost includes design and standardizing on a corporate security platform and the supply and install of camera signage, electric and networking infrastructure and labor spelled the American way for installation in the downtown. Um, who's the third party contribution on this? Three, Mr. Chair, to Council McCreary. That's a grant funding that we received through um, uh, recently. Uh, the police received actually the grant funding for the downtown security system. Okay, so it's it's a it's a grant from another level of government. Correct. Okay, and um, the uh, CCTV system is it going to be simply an archive that we check to see who did what, or we don't plan to have any live monitoring at this point in time, right, Lise? Um, not at this time. Um, we, if the corporate security program that we, the pilot project that we've implemented continues, then it can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, 9C19, I, that may have been Councilor McCurry as well. This is the energy conservation initiatives. It is, you're, you're very quick, Mr. Chair. You're quicker than I am to get there. Um, so we're lowering operating costs by, by implementing uh, energy conservation initiatives. Um, could we get a, for instance, we've got $100,000 a year at infinitum for this um, and really with no detail. Uh, so um, give, us a, give us a peek. 
So these are projects that are either identified through energy efficient, uh, sorry, energy audits or um, through just monitoring of the energy consumptions. And uh, for an example, this could be an LED lighting retrofit a, or supplement um, HVAC retrofit projects in order to upgrade them to ensure that we're getting the most efficient equipment. Um, it could be even um, for used for EV charging stations or for um, other so, uh, renewable energy um, think, uh, items as well. Okay, thanks, Lise. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. I will move on to <clears throat> building and facility. Oh no, sorry, 9C20. We're going to corporate facility management platform, Councilor McCurry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how have we gotten by without this to date? Um, we've been using Excel and Word yeah. and uh, pulling uh, data from our billings to monitor energy management data and just using the uh, corporate network. Um, but there's a lot of inefficiencies in that. Uh, it's uh, managing all of those files and having duplication. And uh, with our, our team growing and our portfolio growing as well, it uh, would be very beneficial and efficient for our team to have access to more current technologies in order to organize ourselves and uh, to um, create better preventative maintenance schedules and keep an eye on that type of stuff, as well as provide um, some kind of a, a front facing platform for our, our internal clients to be able to see updates on ongoing projects and um, our and the, the facilities information as well. So it would allow you to perhaps um, take on some additional portfolio items that you don't look after now. It would allow us to efficiently be able to manage them uh, quite a bit better than we are able to today. And you don't need any more people. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest that at this time. Uh, we have to evaluate that as we as we grow. You wouldn't need any more people to run this system. That's correct. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this item, uh, Lise. So, would it also increase your ability to? manage projects like the parking lot projects for various housing developments in our city? It would uh, help us to maintain an asset database that we'd be able to share throughout the corporation. Um, uh, we don't have the expertise in our department to be able to do the engineering required for the design of a, a parking lot um, within the facilities department, uh, but we are capable of managing those projects with the help of uh, other um, consultants or other uh, um, other expertise um, within our corporation. But if it's, if it's talking about resurfacing a current parking lot, having this type of program would give you a better handle on when exactly that needed to be done and that's for, that, that approach, right? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moving on to 7C21, the Fleet Electric Bus Feasibility Study. Uh, uh, I'm guessing Councilor McCurry. You guessed correctly, Mr. Chair. You're becoming quite clairvoyant. Um, so this is a uh, electric vehicle bus feasibility study to assess the conversion of the bus fleet to fully electric buses to compare various types, uh, to determine what will best meet our needs, include an assessment of the electrical infrastructure um, and determine what upgrades are required. And we're gonna pay $175,000 for this out of the capital fund uh, allocated to transit. Um, how many electric bus manufacturers are there? And when would we be looking at purchasing? Uh, through the chair, uh, Shane Pepper, fleet manager. Um, there are currently electric bus manufacturers available or electric, electric buses available in Canada. I believe there are four, four, four that uh, build a 40 foot conventional transit bus. Okay. Um, how many companies are there that manufacture tandem dump trucks? Uh, to date that I know of, none. Tandem dump, no, sorry, not electrics, tandem dump trucks. Oh, uh, of the chassis in the North American market, six maybe. Okay. Um, when we make our purchase of tandem dump trucks, do we engage a consultant? 
No, we don't. Uh, we currently have the expertise and knowledge to know that we have diesel fuel stations, tanks, and infrastructure in place to fuel them. We have e equipment, training, tooling, and technology to maintain them. Mm -hmm. um, are those resources available from the manufacturers of the buses? From the manufacturers of the buses, they will, uh, some of them do, some of them do provide support on how to prepare for and how to invest in uh, infrastructure and training and tooling and, and et cetera for their product. Um, however, through our, um, our bid process or uh, public procurement process, we don't always get uh, the opportunity to sole source or pick a bus of, of, of choice. Now, if we were in a position where we could do that, we could possibly engage with one supplier or one vendor to, to work through that process. Um, but today, we just don't know um, which option we get. And if we buy buses in 2023, 2024, and we end up with a different manufacturer in 2027, 2028, um, and who knows where uh, of the four buses available in Canada, two of them are brand new, two of them have been building buses for many years. So we expect them to be around and two of them are, are pretty new. I expect mm -hmm. them to be around, but we just don't know. That's a good answer. And you weren't here uh, long ago when we did just that. We saw sourced buses and uh, we bought a bunch of lemons a couple of times. Uh, so I, I, I suppose you've changed my mind, Shane. Perhaps this is a worthwhile investment. Thank you. Thank you, Council McCurry. Uh, Mayor Davis, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through to you, Shane. So, Shane, I, was trying, I know we dealt with this in the fall and uh, when we would likely begin purchasing electric buses. Um, can you refresh my memory? How many years out is that? Because I know we, the current replacements are the high efficiency diesel. Um, when are we likely going to be purchasing augmenting electric buses to first fleet? I can't remember when is that. So, so through the chair. Um, you know, assuming the stars align and uh, we get the feasibility for uh, the electric bus feasibility study rolled out this year and completed late this year, or early next year, we'll know what our plan is and what our timing is. Assuming we are in a position that we can start to roll out the technology in this current infrastructure, our best hope at this point is to purchase for 2023 or 2024. Uh, that would be four, I think it's four buses by 2024. Okay, so... Question for you. I mean, the, certainly the, the electric vehicles have been around a long time. There's a lot known about them, you know, at least 10 years. Are we still fairly early days on uh, things like electric buses and electric trucks? So through the chair, uh, the, the first part of the electric buses, yes, we, we are still in the early stages. There are only a few municipalities in Ontario um, that have electric buses uh, in service. There are a few within the GTA that are purchasing this year and we'll have a couple in service and are piloting and testing. So yes, it's still relatively new. Now there are some larger fleets, I believe down in, in California, et cetera. Um, but yes, very relatively new here in Canada. And the next second part to the trucks, yes, um, there's not opportunities yet lots of talk we're hearing lots of stuff but when I reach out to our, our vendors and suppliers they're telling me it's still a couple of years away and what is available in electrification for a, a heavy class truck is it doesn't meet the application for our needs the main goal here the main target is highway use that's where the that's where they're aiming for and that's where the development and the engineering is is for highway transportation in a tandem axle truck used for winter maintenance and salt management systems we're not there yet yeah probably be into hydrogen um but so i guess my my concern i'm fully committed to climate change as part of it but i'm a little bit worried about the timing because in your experience when you're bringing in new systems like this does the do the infrastructure needs and how you maintain and how you set it up does that when you're at early stage does that often change like significantly or radically based on um, the experience of other municipalities and manufacturers and that sort of so through the chair, that's what we're hoping to gain through the feasibility study, the answers to those questions. And when we, when we, you know, we tiptoe or, or we leap into this next stages, we're, we'll be doing it with a lot of other municipalities um, there. This is 
uh, a lot of them are their targets and goals are aligning with ours for the, in the next three years. So we'll we'll make the plunge one way or another, I think, together uh, and be able to reach out, communicate with each other, learn from each other and have those discussions. So when I when it's us jumping in, it's also a lot of our neighboring municipalities are in the same situation we are. Yeah, well, what I'm getting at, though, you expect the best practices that let's say they're in place this year or next year, maybe a lot different than best practices for electric bus fleets, say, in two, three, four years? Uh, I would say that's, I, through the chair, yes, I would say that's a fair assumption. But I guess the way you see it is we would be part of that that leading edge with a bunch of other municipalities figuring all that out. Yes, potentially. Again, if, if we can get these projects approved and we can get started on them, then we, we could be in a position to be leading leading edge in this technology, yep. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, next on my list is Councilor Vanderstelt. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Shane, um, I apologize for the, the question, but it is health and safety related. Uh, when people wait for a bus, they hear the bus, they hear the air brakes, they hear the diesel. Uh, if we move to full electric buses, um, and they're always in close proximity to pedestrians and downtown traffic and whatnot, how do, how do people hear these buses? What's the indicator? Um, to the chair. So yes, this has come up. This is, the, you know, I think the manufacturers are aware of this. We have actually piloted, or I shouldn't say pilot, but we demoed a couple other different types of electric vehicles recently. And one thing we're hearing from the manufacturer is a bit of a white noise or a humming noise or a background noise to make the vehicles uh, motion uh, detective, whether it's a fake noise or, or exactly how they're, how they're doing it. I don't know the details yet, but that is being considered and, and is being looked at. Okay, and that, that would be, I, I would presume, uh, involved in the feasibility study to, to ensure that whatever option we end up with, whichever company supplies us, uh, that we have something that is crowd tested. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Councillor. We I will make a note that we will include that in the feasibility study, and we will we will certainly bring that on the table for discussion. Okay, thank you, Shane. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. And moving on to 9C22, that's the Vision Zero Road Safety uh, Capital Item. Uh, was that was that you, Council McCurry? No, that was the mayor. Uh, I got Councillor Weaver's hand up. Uh, mayor, you have the floor. All right. Um, okay, this question is born out of a sense of frustration. I think around the council table and through the community, a lot of people have heard about red light cameras, but have been in place many years, and like even Hamilton, and you know the speed control cameras. And so my frustration is now like a feasibility study. Why is this taking so slow? Why aren't we? Like moving right on a, a budget allocation for let's get the the design of the red camera system and at the same time do those speed control camera design system as well. Why is it taking so long and why is it now a feasibility study? I mean, it's progress, but can we make more rapid progress on this issue? The chair to Mayor Davis. So this this came out of the Vision Zero Road Safety Task Force for us to we had a presentation at that task force and and the, the uh, recommendation from that task force was to hire a consultant to see where um, best to place these cameras. And so that's, that's where this project has come from. I don't see this process taking long, uh, the funding and the, and the, the consultant's uh, uh, work isn't that intensive. So we've got a rollout plan for 2021, like I mentioned in my um, opening remarks that you'll see a lot of movement in this uh, Vision Zero uh, upcoming year. Uh, and uh, as part of the consultants' uh, work, they are going to look at a high level uh, for uh, the automated speed cameras as well. So is it really necessary we do this study or let's just jump right into it? So. Uh, jumping right into it, we just want to make sure that we're hitting the proper intersections where we see a lot of this uh, 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 claims or whatever coming through. Um, so we want to make sure that if we are implementing a program that they're actually being implemented in areas uh, that are needed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you. And next I have Council Weaver as Chair of the Vision Zero Safety Committee. Council Weaver, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Carpenter. I, I think I brought a resolution forward to council two years ago um, for us to start doing this. So um, I, I appreciate the mayor's um, sentiments. I, I, I'm, I'm also concerned the length of time this is taking, but I do appreciate um, the process. It's not just paying somebody to put them in. We have a lot of study work to do. And um, that's the work that this money is going to uh, pay for. If we didn't do this work and we just went directly to um, the vendor, this would be something we would have to do anyway. So this is good progress. But um, Indy, I, I'm hoping that um, when we do uh, hire a consultant providing this passes uh, committee today, that you can give council some reassurance on a timeline and just sort of walk us through what the timeline is going to be before we can get these implemented. Because I think we're all um, have been waiting very patiently for a very long time, please. So thank you. Yes, we can do that through the chair. Uh, and we plan to do that, uh, bring something to the task force, which will ultimately come forward to council. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Weaver. Councillor Martin, uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. One of the other delays with this is the whole uh, red light camera system was under a contract to a particular vendor through the province. And that contract had a, a fixed term to it and you couldn't feasibly come into it in the middle of the, of the term. So you have to wait for the end of a five year period in order to, to get in. And that was one of the barriers that we were faced. As well, the, the speed cameras have only recently been approved for municipal use, I believe. Uh, it's something that wasn't even allowed up until just recently. So it's something that we're, we're looking at with that committee and uh, hopefully we'll see something good come out of that fairly soon with the, the results of this study. And through the chair, you're absolutely right, Councillor Martin, that, that is the case. And, and uh, we also have to understand now, there are some efficiencies throughout the year that I brought forward to council as well in, in terms of how staff report back. There's going to be impacts, obviously, the POA and see how many charges we can handle per year. But um, in terms of the automated speed cameras and communities that are going through that right now, um, just to be uh, upfront and transparent, putting a camera in right away, doesn't happen in terms of the timing. Yes, we can purchase them, but there is a, a requirement from the province in terms of notification to the community. And so you're either putting the camera in place and not energizing it for 90 days, or you're putting up a sign saying camera coming soon for 90 days and then putting the camera in. So um, when it comes down to it, we start implementing that, there is that, that uh, lag time before the cameras are actually operational. So we'll get into all of that detail for council when we report back. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor Udley, you now have the floor, yeah. sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Indy. Uh, Indy, will mobile radar units be speed cameras? Be, uh, are they being considered? Yeah, so at a, at a high level in terms of the dollars that were available um, uh, through the, the committee that we've put for this, we've um, we were actually able to write a, a, a request for a proposal um, uh, actually lower than this budget and still able to capture the high level review of what's needed to bring in automated speed cameras. So um, kudos to Councillor Weaver for helping with that um, initiative and saving some dollars here uh, potentially. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm moving on to 9C20, stormwater, Tootle Heights slope stabilization. Um, I, which councillor was this? That was the mayor. Oh, Mr. Mayor, you have the floor then. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. So uh, this is the slope monitoring program to Tula Heights. Is this cost shared with the county? Because there's something about this came out of the boundary, the boundary adjustment, the boundary agreement, right? So what's, do we cost share this to the county? What's their involvement in this? Um. Through the chair, it's uh, Wendy Tupel, manager of design and construction. Um, currently, um, this monitoring program is within the city uh, limits. Uh, it's a part of the EA that the County of Brant uh, completed prior to the boundary expansions. And so part of this monitoring is, is part of what the ministry had requested us to do. Um, we're currently working with the county in regards to this EA at the Tutila Heights. Right, because part of the slope is in the county, right? 
I see you nodding your head. I think I think you agree. With me. Oh, uh, um, through the chair, Russ Russ Luke's would like to speak. I think you're muted, Russ. Russ, we can't hear you. Your mic's not working. What did you try it again? Can I talk? Oh, no, it, it's Russell looks like for some reason my computer stopped working. So uh, you're right. The the ouch. the the uh, soap is uh, does go through the county and the city. You're <laughs> correct. And the monitoring program we do we do share the costs and share the results with the county. Uh, so they're putting a portion of the the cost to do that monitoring. And as Wendy pointed out, it came out of the environmental assessment study to look into that uh, that core to that slope and determine what to keep an eye on it to watch how it moves. So we are sharing that information and sharing that cost. And, and this is the area of the slope that's uh, closest to the road, right? Yes, uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct. All right, and what, what's gonna happen if the slope monitoring says, uh oh, there is something bad happening and need to take remedial measures? Through the chair, that's what we're currently working with the County of Brant with as requested by the ministry. Um, on avenues on how and when would we have to close the road? Uh, what kind of conditions, you know, would get us to meet that? What about uh, remedial remediation works on the slope or moving the road? Uh, through the chair, those are um, some items at a high level that we're discussing with the County of Brant, but we'd like to currently close off the EA and then continue those conversations at another time. Oh, I, can you hear am I, am I? Can you hear me now, anybody? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm just catching on part of that through the chair, if you don't mind. The, uh, you're asking about uh, other remedial measures on the slope itself, I believe. Well, either on the slope or you move the roadway, right? I mean. You do one or the other. So, so there's a couple of things to, to point out. So the, the environmental assessment that was done uh, did not recommend any remedial measures on the on the slope itself. It did uh, speak though, however, that we continue monitoring the slope and determine whether there is a point where uh, there needs to be uh, the road closed and moved over. So part of the work we're doing as a result of the environmental assessment is to is to work with the, the county on uh, alternative access for some of the uh, a road um, management plan, I guess, is what we call. I think that's an, an item on the list as well, so that they we can be prepared for that eventuality as it goes on. But the key thing is the uh, is the monitoring, and I think some of the results now are showing very little movement on that slope right now in, in the city portion of it, and the, we're working with the county on that to look at if there's an alternate routes for getting people from the uh, a backup plan for the road management. That's part of the. Yeah, what's the procedure in the province when you have municipalities that do that and one agrees to move the road and one doesn't? How do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, th so through the chair, uh, so that I think that requires, I don't think the province to get involved, that requires some discussion between the two groups. And that, as Wendy's pointing out, that's we're keeping those lines of communication open. If, uh, if one side says, you know, we like to close the road and we're indicating, well, that road is, is important for our, our community for a safe access and alternate access, we do want to keep. Uh, those lines of communication open uh, and we're, we are looking into that as well what what rules we have but so far we've been on a cooperative level on the staff basis to come up with some plans and they're willing to work with us on those on those possible solutions great thank you mr thank you mr mayor uh, councillor vanderstelt you now have the floor sir thank you mr chair uh through you to russ uh, how how is the cost uh divided if if the county's portion of uh of bank fails and the road fails they pay for their section if it's us we pay for ours in our section is, is that how that works out uh through the chair the item we're talking about is, is about the the monitoring we do share that cost on on keeping an eye on what comes out at the end of it uh could be that whatever roads being built on there in the county side may be under their construction and the city may be on, on theirs, but those kinds of details will have to be ironed out when we get closer to that point. But right now, this is a, yeah. But but none of those agreements or understanding are ironed out right now. So should it happen, we'll, we'll be at, uh, we'll be unprepared for the answer, correct? Uh, uh, through the chair, 
No, not necessarily. And that, that's like I say, as Wendy's pointing out, we've uh, we continue to monitor it and we continue to have those open conversations that we can that we can come up with. Right now, we're not at a point where we're we need to do that, but we are having discussions about what uh, what they would want to do on their side and what we can do on our side. Okay, is is there some sort of an indication that you would be able to bring back to council on uh, recommendations on what would happen should there's a problem? Uh, through the chair, absolutely. It would, be, it would be necessary to have to come back with those kind of discussions with council before any actions are taken. Uh, Mr. Hutchings, I, I see your hand up. Yes. Just trying to get the chair to write. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Councillor, uh, we're, we're planning on bringing a report back on some initiatives with the county and uh, previous to previous report back in June with some cost sharing as well as some of these other matters regarding the boundary lands agreement that plans of being forth. I'm just reviewing the report now and should, something should be coming forth in the next uh, next two or three weeks. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we no further questions on that one. I just have one quick question on it. Uh, is the um, Bell Homestead at risk as uh, part of the slope? Uh, I, I understand the parking lot has been had to move a couple times because of erosion on the bank. Uh, I just checked with Wendy. You know, I, uh, through the chair, no, at this point, it's not, a, it's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to 9C26, uh, CTV Sewer Inspection Program Storm Water. I think that's Councilor McCurry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff. Um, so we, this is an annual program um, and we're spending $125,000 a year. Um, is there a reason why this is capitalized? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so it's both the uh, water and wastewater, different uh, um, uh, CCTV programs happen. Uh, so this is a capital program um, that uh, it's been set up that way for years uh, because the operating budget for the CCTV or any of the storm budget is limited. So it is on the capital. Um, does that is that satisfactory to our standard accounting rules? Um, Joel, sorry. Thanks, Joel, Joel, I'll answer that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, regardless of whether it's a capital um, item or an operating item, we are governed by um, general accounting principles and public sector accounting principles that um, do determine how we would report that and something, any type of uh, just um, annual maintenance and studies and those types of works at the end of the day would be reported as an operating expenditure. This is a this is a this is a um, an ongoing subcontract that we have with a third party, right? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. So I, I think um, I think in future years it should be an operating rather than capital. Um, now, Selvi, with respect to um, the work that gets done. Uh, in this, so there, as you said, there are two two separate accounts, right? There's one for water, one for uh, sewer. Through you, Mr. Chair. So there is one for sanitary or wastewater. There is right. other for stormwater. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so um, this is done with a with a camera on a stick, basically, and it shot down the um, the uh, length of the pipe and um, gives you a visual record of what it sees. Um. Through you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, that is correct, uh, but there is a standard that uh, the videoing has to follow. So there is a camera, it's actually on uh, wheels uh, that yeah. rolls through the sewer system and uh, the anything that's found in uh, like uh, cracks or anything, it should be noted where exactly it is and, the, and it's ranked in terms of priority and things like that. So that's a standard uh, exists on how the mm -hmm. CCTV video should be taken. Okay. Um, and if my mathematics is correct, it's $1.50 a linear foot. Um, what percentage of our um, piping do we view annually? 10%. Um, it's a 10-year program. Okay. Um, and what's, what would you expect would be the value of the equipment used by the contractor? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, we... 
Um, if I could kind of jump into probably, I think if you're looking to see whether we could do it or it's a contractor could do this operation, that kind of evaluation was done, um, uh, I would say maybe five years ago, I, uh, exact year, I can tell you. Um, but that evaluation was done. And from the evaluation, it showed that it is uh, better to go with the contractor services. And uh, there is a competitive market out there. And the, actually, the per unit price uh, have dropped in the recent years for CCTV. So we actually get a better uh, value by going with the contractor. There are several reasons uh, we looked at at the time why it has to be contracted out. The technology, the certification level. Um, so um, all of the those was looked at at the time to see uh, which option is better. Okay. Um, it seems like um, a lot of money. And I wonder if you could say um, if, if we actually are um, interceding and saving ourselves money by finding small problems and repairing them, uh, or would we be better off just to, to uh, not have this program and wait for failures? Are we, are we, uh, are we acting on what we see? Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so that is correct. We are acting. There is another capital project in 2021 budget that's called uh, sewer rehabilitation and repairs. Mm -hmm. So there is 200,000 set aside for wastewater and 200,000 set aside for storm sewers. So as the video uh, results uh, comes through, um, the repair work is prioritized and undertaken to prevent any basement flooding and blo sewer blockages. And what percentage um, of the work that you undertake is done from uh, the result of video cam and what percent is done as a result of failures and uh, accidents and emergencies? Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, most of it uh, is through, uh, we want to be proactive because we obviously don't want to cause basement flooding. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the repair is done uh, proactively to avoid um, uh, problem to basement flooding, which is a health and safety issue and a customer uh, service level issue. Excellent. Thank you, Sylvie. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. And moving on to items 9C15 to 9C26, I'll now take a request from the committee for separated items. Sorry, okay. sorry, Mr. Chair, do you mean 27 to 41? Am I, I oh, might yes. Be yes, thank you. Okay, yes, thank 27 you. to 41, sorry. And I have Mayor Davis, your first. Number 60. DC, well, DC 30 and uh, DC 40. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 9C. Uh, was there another one there between 30 and 40? No, sorry, I, I got that wrong. So it's 9C 30, 9C 40. Yep, I got that. Okay, thank you. Council McCurry. Uh, 35. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wall. Thank you. I think Mayor Davis said 30. Is that correct? He did. Great. So then 35. And 35 is, is covered. Councillor oh. Martin. Or Councillor Wall, is that it for you, Councillor Wall? Yeah, Councillor Martin. 38. 38. Yeah. Seeing no others, I'm going to move forward to 9C30, uh, Mayor Davis. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. To um, I just want to comment on it and ask a question. And you know, we've been lucky in many different ways that we have Mr. Hutchings, our CEO. And one of the things that we're so lucky about is I think he's got an aversion to graffiti, and. Um, much, I think he's allergic to graffiti, frankly. And he sees graffiti where I wouldn't even see it. He gave me a set of binoculars. Because, uh, you know, we become so immune to it when you drive by it every day. But uh, not Mr. Hutchings. And so I want to congratulate him. I realize a lot of stuff involved in this, a lot of interdepartment cooperation to make this happen. It's a really impressive program they've come up with. And so that's my question then. So how successful? We now got a couple, I don't know, a month or two experience. It's a great program. 
but is it reducing graffiti? I mean, I, I think I know why, because why would you put graffiti on something where your graffiti won't show up? Because it's the very background. Anyways, are we having success with it in the sense of discouraging graffiti or not, not facilitating graffiti? So through the chair, we, we had just put these systems on. So I'll have uh, Mark Jacqueline comment on if staff have had to go out to those, those that we've already wrapped um, to see if we, if we uh, had that issue. Yeah, yeah I didn't want a lot of time spent on it. Just, you, you know, is it, is it working? That's all. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, currently, we only have, we've only done eight of the 150 cabinets that we want to get done across the city. So currently, yes, it has worked. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I see no others on that. I'm moving to 935, um, 935 Park Condition Assessment. Chair Weaver? Mr. Chair. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Carpenter, sorry. I was hoping to speak to that as well. Yep, go ahead. I'll, I'll give you the floor. Councilor Wall, you take the floor on 9C30. So I agree with everything the mayor said, but uh, I was just curious if it was absolutely necessary that we do it in 2021. It's great and all, but. And this, to Councillor, Councillor Wall, I'll answer that question. No, it's not absolutely necessary to do this in 2021. This is not a, this is, this is a program that where it's, it's basically the, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it improves our city and it's step-by-step, step, it's small steps uh, to our traffic where we control. We are working with Hydro, we are working with uh, the police and a number of other agencies and Canada Post, and this is our con contribution to it to try to show our commitment from the city. But no, this is not an absolute necessity. Nothing is going to, there's no risk of anybody getting hurt or things, systems failing. This is actually just trying to improve our city and show some pride and with putting some history on some of the uh, traffic boxes that are there. Awesome. Um, I don't not support this item. I just was curious if so, but we're a partnership with other people is what you're saying. So this won't get done if we don't contribute. At, at this point in time, if I can for you, Mr. Chair, uh, this we're the catalyst. Uh, the city's obviously taking a lead. We are, Hydro is following. Uh, our close partner, Brantford Power, is doing some work on theirs. Uh, we are trying to uh, bring in Canada Post and as well as CN to show them that we're, we're making an effort and putting uh, skin in the game Hopefully they will as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wall. I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the speakers on the list want to speak to this item. So Councilor McCurry to item uh, 30. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I support this. I, I wasn't entirely certain um, who was responsible for it, but I, I, uh, I suspected it was uh, CAO Hutchings. Um, I just wonder if, um, if this is something that we should be paying for when um, there's probably an opportunity for us to get somebody else to pay for this item. Um, these are also prime advertising locations and um, it's lovely to see the history of Brantford and um, our, um, our heritage displayed here, but um, it might be worth sacrificing one of the four panels to let somebody advertise on there and pay for the whole program. Um, so I, I, I'm reluctant to, to move this out of the budget, but I would like to see uh, staff investigate the opportunity of, of um, incorporating advertising and letting somebody else pay the bill. We can, we can definitely do that, uh, Councilor McCrary, and have that uh, as part of, we have talked about uh, the corporate advertising uh, with that, with a uh, number of things and how we organize that. So that's definitely could be part of the, uh, the mandate. Yeah, maybe we could put civic notices on the sides. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Councillor Weaver, you're next. Thank you, uh, Chair Carpenter. Um, so I, I'm supportive of this uh, initiative. My only concern with it is I, I think we need to take a look at our graffiti issues holistically within the whole city. So we're we're, we're stopping graffiti on these on the city's um, I guess boxes, but that's just moving it to other locations most likely. So. Um, I really just, just a comment to Mr. Chair that we really need to have a, a, a system in place. Um, the fence along um, Shellard Lane, I've complained about it a lot <laughs> and it just keeps getting uh, cleaned up uh, and then it keeps getting vandalized again. 
So we do need to have a process in place to react to those situations quickly. Um, Mr. CAO, I think we have a policy. Yes, we do. Uh, we're also, so the Councilor Weavers, the short answer is yes. We're, we're just, you know, we, we're in the throes with pre-COVID where we're, we brought a number of players together. We were slowed down for about six months. We just met back in early December and we have another meeting late January with this uh, number of groups. And uh, the plan, plan is yes to put a more holistic approach uh, uh, to this with all the agencies that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weaver. Uh, Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Weaver that, um, you know, we clean it up in one spot and then it moves to somewhere else. Uh, the people that like spraying graffiti are gonna spray graffiti somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, Canada Post are starting to implement some very attractive new uh, uh, mailboxes in, the, uh, in some area. They are very attractive. I haven't seen any graffiti on, uh, on any of those uh, at this point. Uh, the other problem we have is uh, not related to this, but it's litter, but it's all part of, if we don't clean it up, we deserve to get the image that we have by our citizens and visitors. So. Um, it's all a big, you know, a big uh, part of uh, changing that image and maintaining a positive, clean image of our city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Vanderstel, you now have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I fully support this initiative, especially a multilateral initiative that helps cover the canvases because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for an open, bare open canvas. Speaking as an artist, I understand that very well. We want to show our art. We want to show our past. We want to show our future. Uh, this is something I, I, I fully support because what it does is it gives people a better understanding of what Brantford thinks about itself. It, uh, it's, it gives us uh, a public portrayed image that we care about our city. We care about how we look. Um, I, I'm just hoping that uh, we uh, will be effective um, over the coming years to uh, show a concerted and steady effort to make sure we keep doing this. Um, I, I can support this amount. I, um, I, I'm looking forward to what's coming back from the, uh, from the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Vanderstelt. Uh, Councilor Antosky, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support this 100% and uh, even more so that we've got the other agencies involved. And uh, the fact that we're taking the lead on this is, is really important. Um, and having those other agencies on board is going to help um, call the spread out from, from the downtown. Um, the, the, the mailboxes that, that Councillor Hartley may be referring to, and I'm not certain, maybe the ones that have the repetitive um, symbol on it all along, and they think it's a postal symbol. And that's because exactly what Councillor Vandersoft just said, um, artists don't they want a clean canvas. So the, the most effective way of, of preventing it is, are twofold. Uh, one, having these patterns or these repetitive patterns on them that their art can't be seen, um, which is why what we're doing with our history is great. It's, it, they're not going to have uh, their art acknowledged. Um, and the other thing, um, which won't work on these boxes, but is growing uh, vegetation over them. So vines and things like that, you'll never see a wall with vines growing on it, have graffiti on it. So um, those are the two easiest and most cost-effective ways to deter uh, graffiti. So I think this is a great plan. I'm glad that we're talking with our agencies about it. Um, it's, you know, otherwise you've got the broken window theory and uh, if we're not taking care of things, it just gets worse and worse. And so we're, we're taking control of that. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful CAO Hutchings for you taking the lead on this and for getting the other agencies involved. Thank you, Councillor Antosky. Councillor Schles, you now have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I too am in, in, in full support of this program. I was just wondering though, through to, um, I don't, I'm not sure who's handling this, but the $60,000, how many more units will that put out? Through the chair, it's roughly $750 per app. Um, and that's, we have 150 cabinets. So that, that will cover the 150 over the next two years. You'll need another 60 next year, or, or will this 60 take two years to spend? Through the chair, it will take two years to, to uh, wrap all 150 cabinets. 
Okay, and the sixty thousand dollars will cover that through the chair. It's one hundred twenty thousand. Okay, so it's sixty each year. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Sless. And moving on to the last item on this list, uh, C40 uh, Water Treatment Plant Yard and Storage Facility Study. Uh, Councilor McCurry, I believe you had this one. Uh, no, it was uh, item 35, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm sorry, 35, yes. I'm trying to jump ahead too far. You have the floor for item 35. Um, thank you very much. So this is a parking lot condition assessment. We're seeking information on the condition of parking lots to understand moving forward to incorporate a condition index to follow best maintenance resurface replacement practices. Um, and it's $125,000. Um, and I, I, there's a theme in some of the things I'm questioning this year. And one of them is studies. Um, Russ, uh, you've been in a lot of parking lots. And um, I'm guessing you can probably tell which one needs to be replaced and which one doesn't. Through the chair, if I, uh, can you hear, first of all, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, you can, awesome. So uh, yes, I've been in a lot of parking lots. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but the the, the key thing about this uh, undertaking and for a lot of other studies as Indy pointed out in the, in the front end of this study was, we're trying to do an assessment. There's um, this particular, uh, assessment is looking at what's the condition of those lots. We're looking at not only the asphalt, but the drainage, the lighting, et cetera. Um, and we're retaining um, outside services to do that because there's something like uh, 35 lots that haven't been looked at in a number of years. The purpose of this is to get us uh, a good idea of, well, what are the conditions of the lots and can we set up a program uh, with good asset management uh, practices that we can set priorities for what needs to be done uh, get an idea of the costs, and we can start identifying improvements going forward. So it may, um, so some of these lots may be fine, and some may require uh, attention, and then we can prioritize how best um, council can allocate funds for that if necessary down the road. So this is just very uh, initial information gathering portion. Yes, we, we've never had just an informational gathering exercise. Um, this is not repeated in any uh, subsequent years, but I suspect once we get back on our 10-year capital plan, we'll be seeing this every five years. Is that a fair guess? Uh, through the chair, probably not uh, that frequently. This, I think, is probably one of the first times we've done this on a number of these lots. And right now, we're just assembling that list. As you've seen, some people, um, you know, parking lots get identified. Oh, yeah, go fix this one. Well, we want to be able to say, we're fixing this one because of this. And this one is more important to fix than that one. Uh, and you know what the conditions are, so we can prioritize where to best spend our um, limited funds for that kind of work. So this is important to feed into a, a program that will lead to improvements in, like I say, drainage, lighting, asphalt servicing. Um, now, how many how many lots do we have, Russ? What's your best guess on that? Uh, sorry, um, I don't have a, a best guess at how many parking lots, but I say. This, what we put together here is based on about 35 lots, and we'll probably be just talking to other departments, see what other lots they have, but we want to hold firm on the, uh, the amount. And just so this represents about 35. Yeah, just like that's asphalt lots as well. Sorry, um, thank you, yeah, Indy. Yeah, we're not this is a lot, which asphalt. would, yeah, which would be more lots. I would refer you to the, um, to the housing department, Russ, who have a number of parking lots that they were going to be hiring a consultant to study. And um, um, you can pass your expertise on to them. Um, how many, how much, uh, what's the price of asphalt paving per square foot? Money. Remove and replace asphalt paving per square foot. Per meter. Per meter. Square meter. Meter. <laughs> 36 to 35 uh, per meter, square meter. So this would this amount would pave uh, 4,000 square meters? Is that what you're saying? No, no. Uh, through the chair, this is uh, this is not implementation of the improvements. This is no, you and I, you and I, you and I both know that. What I'm saying is the amount of money you want to spend on this study would would pay for an awful lot of asphalt paving. Yeah. 
to the chair, the downside of that is, are you putting, is that what you need to do? Is that what the uh, solution is? Or is there a drainage solution that would fix it? So that's part of the thing is to determine what is this. Going out and just spending money on asphalt may not be the best bang for the buck. It may be other yeah. things we can do instead that wouldn't cost that much and be more uh, beneficial to the, to the lot. And that's the purpose of doing this. Very well said. Thank you, Councilor McCurry. Councilor Wall, you have the floor. So Dan asked a lot of questions. Uh, Councilor McCurry, my apologies, Councilor McCurry, uh, asked many of the questions I was gonna ask. Um, I'm all for it. I just don't think it's time sensitive. And I was curious if it's essential that this is done in 2021, because if not, I would suggest that we hold off. Um, through the chair, uh, one of the key things about doing this study is we are going into the uh, uh, asset management plan this year uh, that we're required to do from legislation. So this would actually be very helpful to feed into that process and that whole asset management um, process and plan that the city's trying to develop. So it would be a good time to start. Would this preclude it if we didn't? Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, through the chair, what I'm saying is we wouldn't have a com uh, complete that asset management requirement without this component. So we shouldn't take it out is what you're suggesting. Just tell me we can't or we shouldn't and I will drop it. Uh, it's in the chair. It's a capital item we should have in our plan this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Um, Councillor McCurry, uh, back on the list. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Russ, I see the Public Works Department has learned the lessons uh, from watching the first night's estimates when other members of staff said, that's okay, we can put it off till next year. Um, I wonder if you could say which of the capital items on your list is the least necessary? Because we're, we're, we probably have an, app, we have an appetite to take something away from you, Russ. Can you, can you tell us what it should be? So I'll defer that to my uh, boss. <laughs> so through the chair, um, this year we really did look at our budget in terms of what is necessary and, and, and uh, presenting that budget uh, prior to getting to this point, we've, we've vetted many, many projects out and what you have is a, a budget that's, that's very trimmed and, and that's why you're hearing some of those. It's not necessarily lessons learned from estimates. Um, it's more so we've, we've done our due diligence to ensure that the money that's being spent this year is needed for this year. An excellent response. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Councilman Curry. And moving on to item 38, that's the inflow infiltration source investigation. Uh, what councilor was asking for that? Was it Councilor Martin? Councilor Martin, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this is the inflow and infiltration source investigation. My question is, is this something that uh, we have the skills to do in-house? And if not, should we? Sorry. Uh, sorry, Councillor Carver. Councillor Carver, uh, no, it's not. It's not the kind of work we can do in-house. Is this something we should be able to do in-house? Is this is something that affects our, our wastewater treatment plant significantly? See, Chair, that, that's correct. And that's why we want, that's, you point out exactly why we want to undertake the, the study. But it's not a service we can do with, with our own in-house services. We need the expertise outside. Okay, and will this cover the whole city or will this just do certain areas? Okay, um, through the chair, this is aimed at heading on the uh, the critical areas in the city. And how much of the city would that be? Wow. Sorry, <laughs> through, sorry, through the chair, I'm just referring to the expert next to me. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not the full city, but it's it does cover uh, uh, probably what we refer to as two, two or three catchment areas uh, in the city where we've, we know we've got, um, or we have concerns about the 
inflow and we want to hit those ones uh, right up front, the most critical areas right now. Would that be determined by the capacity of the pumping stations? Uh, it's a, it's the, um, that would be part of it, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Martin. And the, the last item is 9C40, the technical studies in the waste treatment plant yard and storage facilities that I tried to jump to earlier. And I think that was Councilor McGurry. I believe that was the mayor. Oh, okay. Mayor Mayor Davis, that's you have the floor. Chair, do you got a metal block about my request? <laughs> Just kidding. You. You're doing a great job. Uh, so I can't even remember why I put this here other than I think I wanted to know which yard is this and why? I got mixed up when I read it. It's 324 Grand River Ave, and I really wasn't certain why, what the purpose was. The description left me wondering exactly what it's about. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Mayor, this is about uh, building um, uh, multiple things uh, to uh, the storage facility to do multiple things. One is a gravel storage place. So um, in the winter time, um, we can make sure there is a gravel that's not frozen. Uh, so that's one purpose. Second, we have a place to store the pipes uh, that are used for uh, repairing uh, the sewers and the water mains. And the most important of all is um, a, facility, a drainage um, a drainage location where the material taken from manhole uh, from uh, flushing of the sewers or taken from the manhole cleaning um, and uh, catch basin cleaning all that material has to uh, be dumped in a place and the material the water has to be drained and uh, the solid material has to be hauled to the landfill site so that waste disposal location has to be approved uh, uh, by ministry have to get an ECA approval. So um, that's that's all the scope included. There is geotechnical investigation um, and uh, load bearing uh, needs to be verified for a concrete structure. Um, um, so all that work is involved in the scope. So this is like a facility. It's not, okay, let's dump it over here. Like this part of the yard looks like the place to dump it. It's actually building, uh, it's, a, it's an amenity or facility that would take all this. And the water that's collected, that has to be treated as well, does it not? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, we're um, trying to find a way to get it to the sewer so we don't have to pre-treat it. But obviously we have to remove all the um, uh, solids and the material out of it before putting into wastewater or sewers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council McCurry? Thank Comments you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sylvie, um, could you clarify what you meant by the, the material that you're handling there, the hazardous material? Um, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, so oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. So this is uh, the material when we flush the sewers and clean the manholes um, there, and the uh, cleaning of the catch basins, there is material that is collected. And when we do the vacuum that the material is collected, so uh, all that material has water and solids mixed in it. So we can only take the solids to the landfill, the water has to be drained out. Um, so this is a facility where we can um, drain the water safely following the health and safety protocols, like a waste to disposal site, and uh, the solids will be taken to the landfill. So do we have a Ministry of the Environment license for that? We will be when we build that uh, facility. So are, are we or are we not doing that on that location now? Um, not at this time, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, right now, we are taking it to the landfill and uh, kind of using the landfill. So the ministry kind of indicated that uh, during the landfill inspection, this is something we need to look at and have a proper waste disposal site. Can't just go into the uh, wastewater treatment plant? Um, there is no, uh, it needs a, what the ministry is expecting is a proper disposal location where the water is separated and the solids is separated. So it doesn't matter where we go, it, it needs a, a facility to properly dispose the material. And the truck is going back to the water plant. So it makes, because the distribution uh, collection staff are located there. Um, so it makes sense to have the facility there. And did the, did the ministry um 
happen to bring along a check with their suggestion? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Thanks, Sylvie. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Curry. I'm still laughing. <laughs> Is there any um, amendments to any of these items on this page? Uh, seeing them at this point. Now, uh, it's getting rather late. Oh, Councilor McCurry. Uh, Mr. Chair, I missed an amendment on the previous page. Is it okay to go back to that? Yes, happy to, yep. Um, and it would be 9C6. Oh, that's two pages back. Sorry, yeah, two pages back, yeah. Okay, uh, your amendment on 9C6, which is Technical Studies Transport Optimization Study. Is to uh, move it to the following year. Looking for a seconder. Uh, Councilor Slash is your seconder. Comments? Seeing no comments, I'll call the question to move defer 9C6 to 2021 budget. deferral of capital budget item 9C6 to the 2022 capital budget year carries on a quarter vote of nine to two. Members of the committee vote in favor are as follows. Councillors Sless, Marn, Antoski, Wall, Weaver, Utley, McCreary, Carpenter, Van Tilburg. Those opposed, Mayor Davis and Councillor Van der Stout. Thank you, Councillor McCreary. And as I said at the beginning, uh, I would not prevent any member of the committee from going back and moving amendments or speaking to items, but we're just trying to give some order to it. Now, it's getting rather late, uh, 8.40. Uh, we've been here since 4.30. So what I'd like to do next is really just get uh, your items for separation from 42 to 56, and then we will uh, adjourn uh, until Monday. So any, Councillor McCreary. Um, just bear with me, Mr. Chair. Um, a 42, 43, 45, 47. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, 44, 50, and 52. 44, 50, and 52. Uh, Councillor Utley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 55.56. Thank you. Seeing no further items, I'm, I'll entertain a motion. I, I'm raising this because I know Councillor Weaver has a long day and he's working a lot of hours and he's very tired. And I know that we've been here for uh, four hours and 41 minutes minus our break. Uh, so I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn till Monday. Councillor Weaver, seconded by Councillor McCurry. Thank you all. Great job. A lot of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you to staff. Be Thank safe.